from the beginning. And I was shown that um, uh, that Lucifer would return, that the UN and the Vatican were going to be completely behind it, again, under false pretenses. He's going to show up and say, I'm here to save the day, right? <laughs> Uh, and okay, fine. You know, yeah, of course ahead, you can say it. whatever you want. But I've always hated censorship. It's the internet. Fine, you know. Yep. Sometimes you know, once they get you for your first love bite, well, it depends on how aware you are, right? First of all, as you know, the uh, the Anunnaki and the Draco are enemies. Second of all, underneath Baghdad was a stargate that was created by the Anunnaki so that they could transfer from the middle to the earth. I'll never see the sun. I could just end it all, but the demons will have one. Practitioners that. You know, some are, are good and some use their magic for good and to heal and to help and others do use it for evil. And, you know, in some cases, you know, people really were. Turn your <laughs> this is too much sometimes. From the Broken Ruins of Babylon, this is End of Days Radio. I am your host, Daniel, broadcasting to you all the way from that shimmering emerald city right here in the heart of the Pacific Northwest. Hello, how are you? So excited to be here today. Skate and Destroy, hello to you. Appreciate your kind words. Andy, shout out to you. Looking forward to talking to Gary Wayne today. He is going to be our guest. He's making his return after to end of day's radio after a very long time. <sighs> Andy. Today's date is Friday, July 14th, 2023. It's a very special day in July. It's extremely hot here in Seattle. Uh, very noisy today. Got some Air Force activity going on. I hope it's over. It was going on all day today and it woke me up and it's been hurting my ears, but I need to do a show. So I hope that's it. It's a very big day. Remember to go to endofdaysradio.com for all things End of Days Radio. There you can check and update it. Guest list for the show. You can donate. You can read various articles I've written. And of course, you can donate. You can donate through PayPal or you can donate through Bitcoin. I should uh, put up some links to accept other types of crypto. I don't know if society's really there yet, though. I don't see that many. If for a while there, it looked like we were really moving in that direction. And then the market crashed and eh, back to cash and credit cards, I guess. Um, stay tuned for after the interview today where we will be doing our news roll, and we will be talking a bit of the sports world as well. Our guest today is Gary Wayne. Gary Wayne, author of The Genesis, Genesis 6 Conspiracy, How Secret Societies and the Descendants of Giants Plan to Enslave Mankind, details the role of modern-day Nephilim in Satan's plan to install the Antichrist at the end of days. How appropriate. Shout out to Todd Miller, Todd the Bod. How, what's up? Gary, Main Gary Wayne is a, a Christian contrarian who has maintained a lifelong love affair with biblical prophecy, history, and mythology. 
His extensive study has encompassed the Bible and Gnostic scriptures, the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, Gilgamesh, and other ancient epics, language, etymology, and secret society publications. And actually, he is here to talk about the part two of Genesis 6. So let's be clear on that. This is so big, it's warranted a sequel. And we will see how that differs from the first venture. But let's stop wasting time and get the man of the hour himself on here. Let's see, Gary, are you there? I am, and, and so happy to be here today and happy to uh, talk about my new book and whatever else you and the audience would like to talk about. And you, you are absolutely right. The Genesis 6 is a, a sequel uh, for part two, and uh, it is a very large topic. And... Uh, I suppose, uh, you know, you can never get everything in the books that you want to do, but uh, it is a large topic. And I think uh, if anybody has seen my first book, it's 800 pages. This one is 600 pages, and I probably could have done 800 pages again. So who knows, there might be a third one down the, down the road. Well, we certainly hope so. Don't mind the, so the sound of the jet screaming in the background. We will just pretend that it is the, the thunder of the gods. Yes. Now, or the uh, impending Armageddon. <laughs> ah, I like that. It, it couldn't come soon <laughs> enough. So, Gary, things have been getting weird out there lately. Um, you know, since, let's say, 2020 or so, the landscape of this world, uh, the way that society has been behaving seems to have changed quite a bit. This new world order seems to be in full swing i sometimes ask this of my guests especially now that we're in 2023 but do you feel at all vindicated by the things that have been happening yeah i think so and there's a lot of things yet to happen uh certainly a lot of the things that i talked about uh on on uh, so many of the shows that i do or in my book that people are saying hey it's you know, actually kind of starting to fulfill before our eyes. And one of the things I also like to encourage uh, people to do is, is not to get ahead of end time chronology. It has its own time frame, and it never happens quite the way that you think it's going to happen. So you have to be patient. And if we are indeed in the fig tree generation, and I think we are, then I think the last few years have started to bring on a uh, greater sort of I guess, events that would be reflecting of the sorrows or the beginning of the sorrows. And that's kind of where we are. We're into the fig tree generation, I think, and we're into the sorrows and we're starting to see more wars and rumors of wars. And we're seeing more international chaos. We're seeing uh, pestilence and they're preparing us for more pestilences now. Uh, famine tends to come from uh, catastrophes and wars. and we're seeing more earthquakes. Uh, uh, earthquakes are increasing at a significant rate. So none of these get us into the seals, but where we are is in that generation and we're seeing the jostling around of a, the geopolitical nature and the advancement of the technology to get to where we need to be, to be you know, approaching those last seven years. So I think uh, we're seeing the spirits forces who are working together to to bring this about yes they are frustrated and they ought to be frustrated because they're trying to bring it about before the ordained time so they're going to be continue to be frustrated and they're going to continue to double down and do more crazy things to try and bring about those last seven years and that rendezvous that they're looking for in a time that's before the ordained time so that they can try and deceive people even more so i think we're i think we're on path i think uh, I, I get a lot of comments coming um you know from people saying that you know it's interesting to see what you had put put down and written and, and i just want everybody also to know that when i say i think this is what's going to happen i'm not trying to be a prophet in any sort of way i'm not a disciple i'm not a apostle 
none of that. I, what I do is I sort of look at the research that I do in the Bible and I try and put connect the dots. And from what I see, that's what I say, I think this might happen. So there's nothing there that is, uh, you know, hopefully I have the blessings of, of, of God that goes with it. But uh, I, I, I don't claim to try and speculate too often, but you have to when you're trying to understand sort of end time prophecy. So you have to say, I think this is this is how it's going to happen. Just try not to get too specific on the dates. I, I think that graveyard has a lot of tombstones in it. Definitely. And one thing that these people seem to be very focused on is the astrology, the the tides of the heavens, things like planetary alignments and things of that nature. It seems to have a lot to do with whatever plan they have. Am I right about that? It, it's part of their mystical religion. So astrology and signs from, from astrology come from, you know, the science of astronomy, but it's a perversion of astronomy and it's designed to sort of lead people into polytheism, whether it's horoscopes or anything that has to do with astrology and it's designed to lead people away from God and it's designed to get people to believe that somehow, some way their fate or their destiny is tied to the gods and they control all of it. So as we get closer, and I think we saw, we bore witness to some of the power of the deception and how seducing it is uh, a few years ago. I know when they produced astrology uh, that was showing certain signs in certain, um, uh, you know, uh, star formations, and they're predicting that there's going to be a, a rapture at that point in time. And you just can't put your faith into astrology, but they're going to use that as part of the signs that are going to be coming. And we're going to see signs in the sky, but they're going to be doing counterfeit signs as well. So, and they're going to mix that with their polytheist beliefs and astrology is going to be one of those key avenues that they're going to sort of say, see, this is what it means. And here's, here's what's going to happen. So the thing is, is those uh, catastrophes that come with whatever signs that their false prophets are going to pre present are contrived. And uh, they are, again, trying to create counterfeit miracles and counterfeit signs so that people will believe the coming of their Messiah, which is the dragon Messiah or the Antichrist, and everything's a counterfeit. So we need to be aware of uh, the adversary. We need to be aware of how they deceive people because it's going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And coming with those catastrophes is that fear factor where they're cattle hurdling everybody from sort of polar opposites uh, to end up into the hands of the globalists. And they, uh, they are wanting to bring about that world government. They want that universal religion and they want that absolute control with the technology that sort of goes along with it. So, but all of it is going to maybe be mixed in with uh, what Babylon calls her sorceries. And so, one of the terms that's important to understand with the adversary is that in the polytheist religions, sorcerers are priests. And so when the Rosicrucians and the Freemasons decided to create the Invisible College or the Royal Society, that was the first sort of bastion of science outside of the Roman church. And still is the center and sort of the head office that all science and education through various formats report back to. Understand that these founders who are Rosicrucians and Freemasons, as I just mentioned, called themselves the last of the sorcerers and the first of the scientists. So in the King James Version Bible, you ought not to be surprised in Revelation 18, 23, it talks about how Babylon seduced the nations through her sorceries. Other English translations will um, will translate that as magical spells or something similar to that sort of format. And 
that word sorcery, I mean, it's there because that's their kind of word. It's we, We're talking about King James Version language. That's Baconian English that was designed to be the universal language for what they perceived uh, a descendant of King James who would be the unicorn king and Antichrist or one of his descendants would be. So they're plotting all of this very, very long ago. And that word sorceries comes from, you know, three different source words that are Greek, but all related. So it's pharmakia, pharmakos, and pharmakos. And when you look at how it relates into, let's say, contrived pestilences, and you look at how the approach was in the last pestilence with, with prevention for that pestilence, Pharmacia, which is the root word for pharmacy and pharmaceutical, whether it's legal or illegal, was one of those key aspects. And further, you know, pharmacia can mean magical spells and, and alchemy. And of course, that's part of those seven sciences. That's part of polytheism. And so you can expect that alchemy and all sorts of other things that have a specific agenda that would provide like a magic spell or a change of the of the individual receiving that type of pharmacia as part of the deceptions that are going to be down you know happening in the world so babylon says she seduces the world with these sorceries so one expects a full-blown opening up of drugs both legal and illegal and a continued um doubling down and quadrupling down and even more so on how they're going to falsely lead the people that they can give themselves, give them longer life and, and, and give them protection from the pestilences that they're going to cause. And by doing so, they get control of them. It's that was interesting what you just said. But... Definitely. That was interesting what you just said about the unicorn i know the unicorn is still used in uh isn't it used in the uh crest of the royal family in england oh it certainly is they have uh, a single unicorn just as the stuarts had a single unicorn and the windsor family uh, whose name used to be hanover and succeeded just before the the american revolution of the stuart dynasty they have dual unicorns and a unicorn is not what most people sort of been, for lack of a better word, you know, convinced of or brainwashed into. It's not this sort of mythical, cute, little cuddly, uh, little horse that's playful and somehow because it was playing as the mythology goes, um, didn't hear the calling uh, to, to the ark. It didn't get called to the ark because it was a chimera type of animal. A unicorn has two meanings in the occult. Um, one is, as we'll stick with uh, the horse aspect of it, it was a chimera type of stallion that the giants rode on with a single horn. Uh, a unicorn, so to speak, and it was white uh, and other colors and had different sort of animal parts to it. And they rode that into the war. And even after the flood, and I cover I cover this off in the new book, even after the flood, uh, you have all of these depictions throughout history of these bred larger horses that the Raphaim would ride into or uh, war with or what the Persian horses of the Aryan dynasty of the Achaemenids had or uh, whether it's the horse that um, uh, um, I'm trying to think of his name um, out, of, out of Alexander the Great sorry about that and or any of the Roman empires they always rode a white horse or a black horse but predominantly a white horse it's the same horse that's depicted on the riders of the shea with the two off the Dedan, and they put this gold helmet with a single horn on so this this has a very specific meaning but as it also portrays itself um as part of the unicorn bloodline in the unicorn dynasty that is 
portrayed and communicated in sort of taciturn language that the coat of arms are designed to do it it shows their genealogies that go way back into prehistory and so the i also know that is there's uh i was looking at some pictures of the um you know the people the people known as the scythians they wore armor and they would put these like masks on their horses that had like one one um horn yeah. i mean it was metal but it was like a mask and I think that was kind of meant to make them look like a unicorn. Yep. Yeah. And the Scythians were giants. Scythians hmm. were Tuatha Dé Danann. They were part of the four Indo-Aryan races after the flood, which we would know as would include the Raphaim. And so, yeah, they were keeping that imagery up. And the Tuatha Dé Danann were originally Scythians. So they get that whole mythos that sort of comes down with them. And they were master horsemen. Uh, master charioteers and they exported that into all the different sort of countries that they invaded and took over the, the the royal bloodlines and started their dynasties so it's an interesting relationship to that horse but there's a secondary meaning as well uh, so that why it's on the coat of arms so if you look at uh, coats of arms, they'll have a lion on there, or they'll have a dragon on there, or they'll have eagles on there, or they'll have, or a phoenix-like, but it's the same sort of imagery, or um, they might have, um, I'm trying to think what the other one that I missed on, it doesn't really matter, but they got all of these specific animals that have specific origins to specific kinds of beings and so if you look at greek history where i think it's modeled the best is you have apollo and zeus and others who had chariots that were pulled by these white horses and then in the older depictions they had a single horn and so these are sort of that same reference where the chariots of the gods come from and so they're counterfeiting the throne of God with this chariot, and it's led by these these six unicorns. Um, and that's that's a very interesting, and it's an allegory. So what is counterfeiting is a scene in, in, in the book of Ezekiel, in Ezekiel 1, 3, and 10. And in there you get the throne of God, right? And it's got the cherubim in there, and it's got the wheel uh, angels, uh, which is the word Ophan or the Ophanim. So those are the throne angels that are depicted in the book of um, Enoch and that word uh, wheel, when it's referring to the wheel angels versus the wheel of the wheel within the wheels, that would be Gilgal, but the Hebrew word for the being is Ophan. And I am is the male plural, just as in cherubim. And also in the book of Psalms, you have the cherubim who are leading the chariot. Uh, and pulls the chariot of God. And so it's a counterfeit of that. So when you look at what that unicorn represents, it represents a cherubim. And of course, a cherubim had four faces. It had the face of a man, it had a face of an ox or a bull, it had a face of a lion, and it had a face of an eagle. And you get a lot of this similar... Um, features of that on the coats of arms and the seraphim would be the dragon imagery and i often so hear that saying, term that uh, they say that anything that god does satan copies yes he counterfeits everything yes and so they take their their genealogies not only back to specific patriarchal nephilim or raphaim but they take their genealogies back to a godfather, a fallen angel. And originally they might have looked very similar to those angels. So if you have like um, like the Sumerians or the Ugarit where they're depicting their kings as serpents, that's because they would have been procreated by a seraphim. So if a cherubim was to reproduce, you could have a human face probably with the dark hair, which are more the sort of Aryan sort of variety. Uh, you could have a lion-faced man, like um, the lion men of Moab, or the lion-like people of Gad, and or Arioch, 
which is one of the four kings out of Mesopotamia in the war against war of giants in Genesis 14. And that means lion-like. And Ariel would be in the occult, one of the angels that would have produced these lion-like individuals, or Nergal, as it would be referred to in the Bible, uh, that's connected to the Avim. So it's important to understand then that if you have a unicorn that is represented in uh, the coat of arms of an antichrist candidate with the Windsor clan or the Stuart clan, uh, then it becomes an important understanding if you know that unicorn that's used in the King James Version Bible should not be translated as unicorn, should be translated as a wild bull. Now, again, in their understanding, if you look at an ox or a bull, it's part of the cherubim, right? So it's 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 kind of got that same double sort of metaphor to it. And unicorn is the single horn that rises amongst uh, the horns, uh, the ten horns in Daniel 7. And it's the single horn of Daniel 8. And where the King James Version Bible uses unicorn. It's used in relationship to a world empire. It's also used in relationship to Mount Hermon because the Rephaim were the ruling council of the Baalim at Mount Hermon after the flood and are said in the Ugaritic text to have created the Rapiu or the Raphaim as we would understand them, the post diluvian giants, which is the Nephilim or the fallen one order that has ruled after the flood um, by what we call offspring gods, uh, like Baal and the Baalim gods that worked in that council, and or the parent gods that ruled before the flood. In this case, you would have e uh, El or L as in uh, the parent god, and let's say Astaroth is, is a, a one of the count counterparts. And you have offspring gods and parent gods in all the different cultures. So like Anki and Enlil are offspring gods that rule after the flood, but Anu and Tiamat are parent gods that ruled before the flood. In Greek mythology, you have, let's say, Gaia and Kronos as the parent gods and the other gods that go along with it, like Iapetus. But after the flood, you have, you know, like Zeus and Poseidon that are ruling, which are are the offspring gods, and they take over and they either help the giants survive the flood or they recreate them, and I think more likely recreate after the flood. Um, so it's interesting that they have these patriarchal Nephilim that they take their genealogies back to. They have these patriarchal godfathers they take their genealogies back to, and that King James with the Baconian writers um, who were doing the translation, they change the word unicorn in relationship to certain things that are important to them and and what they would like to see for the future. So I don't think they've totally corrupted the King James Bible by any stretch of the imagination, but know that there are other, there are a few other translations that are, are that are a little bit dubious. Um, and I think the King James is a very good translation, by the way. But understand, we have to understand that they controlled the elite controlled with their bloodlines, all of the education and all of the nobility class and any translation that came down from Hebrew and Greek for the Old and New Testament was usually translated by bloodline people. So you have to expect they're going to do a little bit of corruption with it. So, so basically, for the most part, we only know what they want us to know. Well, I wouldn't quite go that far. I mean, they do in everything else, but sort of like the Bible. It's just that, you know, they one of the reasons they created the King James Version Bible is they wanted to convert their Polychronicon, which was the oral traditions of history, into a written format. And so they they look at a lot of the old things in the Old Testament as being accurate, maybe a little different polytheist lens that they're looking at it, but it's part of the larger sort of ancient polychron history that they have and they wanted a a book that they could do in plain sight to swear oaths on because they're part of this oath-based society uh, that was originally created uh, with the creation of the giants through the harem anathema oath that was taken on mount ermine according to the book of enoch or 
the accursed oath of Haram, C-H-A-R-A-M, as we would know in the Old Testament, to carry it out no matter what the consequences. And they have enforced their oath-based system ever since. And we just saw the coronations, and they usually have two, one immediate and then one a formal one afterwards. It's through the ancient rite of inheritance where it's an oath-based uh, divine right to rule that's being inherited. And then they imposed, after the King James Version Bible was done, complete oath-based system through the complete English-speaking countries. And everything you do has oaths sworn to it, uh, which is their belief system. And biblically, we're told not to swear oaths because we're going to be held accountable to them. Can you tell us a little bit more about Dragon Messiah? Why Dragon Seraphim typically are understood at the top of the angelic realm, uh, although I might make a good case that archangels might even be a little bit higher. Uh, certainly probably maybe four of them. That might be known as the four presences, both in the Bible and in, in the Book of Enoch. But typically the seraphim are the ones who are what? governing the earth. Um, and... Uh, are responsible for the religion and the governance. And so in that understanding, a seraphim angel is a six-winged serpent-faced angel. And so an angelic dragon. And so in antiquity, a dragon and a serpent were kind of considered synonymous. Uh, there may be different varieties of physical dragons or different nahash as they may have been uh, an image, which is the Hebrew word for serpent, um, that was in Eden um, before they were degraded down to snake level. Um, but they may have wings, some may have arms, they may have different varieties. Uh, but it's a mythos that's sort of been kept on. So dragon is a very important word to them. And in Greek, we get the word draconta, and uh, draconta means watcher. Uh, just as we get Watcher in Daniel 4, and the sons of God would include the four groups of Watchers. So you have the archangels, you have the seraph and the cherubim and the Ophanim. And uh, the Netaru gods, the parent gods of, of Egypt as well, were also called, uh, uh, translated those as Watcher gods as well. And these are generally serpent-faced or dragon type of angels. So you get in that hierarchical structure, both before and after the flood, these dragon gods, so whether or not it is Osiris being depicted as a dragon or Zeus being depicted as, you know, serpentine or Anki and Enlil, um, the parent gods before were depicted in a similar way. way. You also have the dragon gods and creator gods of China. You have the Nagas in China. You have the plumed and feathered serpent of uh, Central and South America. This is that major order that was controlling governance. Just as Daniel 4, you have a watcher coming down that are, is discussing the, the, the edicts of God for the rule of the earth. And so... Uh, that's the Hebrew word, Ayir. And uh, so those serpent gods um, and serpent imagery goes throughout the world as a common imagery for the gods, as we've mentioned, and for the kings, you know, just as the uh, pharaohs would wear that sort of cobra <laughs> um, headdress. And uh, Naga goes back to a word that means cobra <laughs> in Sanskrit. So again, it's just it's one of those co common legacies, and, this, and so this gets the into would look the, just like them and be a dragon messiah to answer the question. Awesome, and this kind of gets into sorry about the airplanes. This kind of gets into uh, what I've heard you talking about a lot recently, which is the uh, Dracula connect connection, the um, uh, court of the dragon, as well as uh, Dracula's father. This all ties together, doesn't it? It does, because. Uh, you know, Dracula is uh, uh, means son of a dragon, Dracul. With the A, it means a son of a dragon. So you have Vlad the Impaler and Dracula, who the son of the dragon, the um, 
is based on. Um, and that's uh, an imagery that is related back to an, an, an allegory for the Nephilim. I mean, he's part of the undead. So if you look at what happens to Nephilim and Rephaim, they're disembodied spirits. They don't, their spirits don't sleep. And so they're undead. They're not permitted into heaven. And some go directly to the, uh, to the abyss as the ones spoken of in, in Ezekiel 32, the terrible ones, and, and also in uh, Isaiah 14. Some wander the earth as in dry places and try and possess people to physically interact in the world. And in the occult rituals, if done properly, they actually are paraded into where their heaven is, which is the underworld, where their gods rule from. Um, and in Egypt, they go on a boat, but it's all sort of the same sort of allegorical sort of imagery. And so Nephilim and Raphaim used to drink blood to give themselves longer life after they lost their immortality with the counterfeit spirit that they received from their fallen angels. And that's recorded in Genesis 6-3 in the creation of the giants, uh, that life is limited to 120 years because God's spirit isn't going to uh, remain with man forever. And if you take that back to Hebrew, this has got nothing to do with Noah's commission. And Noah's commission only adds up to be a hundred years and the Bible doesn't make math mistakes. So, and, and the context and the meaning just doesn't fit. They've just overlaid that. And so the allegory in the Dracula movies with the Cobra vampire teeth, again, you get that imagery is, is that they're drinking blood to keep their immortality. And Dracula was based on Vlad the Impaler who was educated at the school of Solomon in Vienna Ooh. in the mysteries and was a high level adept as a Royal bloodline as he, as he was. And he had very pale skin and he had hazel eyes and he had red hair and he had an aversion to sunlight and uh, he drank blood in rituals as the elite did. And he's a Scythian. He takes his bloodlines back to Scythia as part of the Tuatha de Danan that we talked about. And to a tribe uh, that was the, uh, the Agrithi, uh, that was a tribe produced by Hercules as their patriarch. And so all of that imagery is interwoven into that. And so uh, when you see that imagery of a bat, that's kind of like an allegory for a dragon that it can change itself into and that changeling sort of aspect that, again, is part of that angelic sort of connection back to angels being able to take any form that they have. And at the time of Vlad the Impaler, uh, there was an organization that he was permitted to go into because there was a movement to sustain and, and overthrow some of the thrones that were not part of their belief system, let's say Roman Catholic uh, controlled or a rival bloodline. And so they created the Sarkani Rond or Ordo Draconis, as it was understood, to regain the thrones of, of Europe in, in continental Europe and to reestablish the pursuits of Thoth. So that's an Egyptian god of wisdom that Enoch, son of Cain, was associated with before the flood. And that they wanted to redevelop uh, the development of the knowledge, which again sort of led to um, the, the Renaissance with that starting of the uh, renewal of the pursuits of Thoth. And also later with the uh, creation of sister organizations of the of the invisible college or the royal society that we talked about and so this organization was part of the anjou bloodline and of course the anjou bloodline uh, has three different candidates for the king of jerusalem title and the one that holds that title at least they say the legitimate title is king philippe of spain um, who inherited it from his father, Juan Carlos, uh, through the Habsburg-Lorraine dynasty. And that all sort of links back, and same with the other two Anjou lines of, of Naples and von Habsburg, who is 
uh, has the uh, a claim on it as well through the Habsburg Lorraine connection. Goes right back to Baldwin II being crowned in 1118 in a small priory uh, on a rock in um, in in Zion as being the king of Jerusalem, and they have scioned into their bloodlines at least according i don't know whether it's true or not but they believe it that's important and what they do with their belief is really important that they have benjamite bloodlines grafted into that royal bloodline and joshua gave jerusalem to the benjamites in, in the time of the exodus and so they were crowned with their but they believed inherited right to the king of Jerusalem title that Antichrist, if they're the ones who will be successful in presenting their bloodline to be Antichrist, will be crowned king of Jerusalem at the abomination at the midpoint of the last seven years. And so all of this, I mean, you could just sort of go on in, in, in so many different directions with that connection into Vlad the Impaler, but it takes you all takes you all the way through their sort of belief system and what their end goal is. And what would that be? Well, they there are rivals all around the world and there can only be one. Uh, so it's kind of like the Highlander movies, which is sort of the fairy allegory, which is the quickening that, the, that you see in there that's also laced into it where you have all of these warrior giants and Actually, one wins at the end in that series, and he becomes the Messiah of the world and the Savior of the world. So you have all of these rivals that are competing. But there can only be one family in their belief system that's going to create the counterfeit millennium or the Fourth Reich, as some people sort of expand that on with the Nazis as, as having their, you know, their promised Third Reich, that Hitler, which would be an Antichrist-type figure, uh, was trying to accomplish. So you're going to have bloodlines from all over the world who are saying they're Antichrist in both in the epistles of John and in Mark and in Matthew, Jesus warned us about, in the latter two, Jesus warned us about multiple antichrists. And we need to be aware that there's going to be lots of rivals. We just don't know who it's going to be. Um, and some people say it's not even a human, but that's a whole different um, uh, discussion. But from what they believe, what the spurious offspring believe, is, is that they will present their dragon messiah from a seraphim bloodline. What do you, how does like these books, Dan Brown books about Da Vinci Code and angels and demons and all of that, how would that fit into this? Is, does he have the right, right idea or is this like them trying to sell us on the idea that Christ comes from these bloodlines? What do you think of that? Well, First of all, the Da Vinci Code is technically a fiction. But that doesn't mean that they don't use that type of literature for Gnostic purposes or polytheist purposes. So it's, it's a bit of a fiction with the characters and things like that, but the whole belief system is laced in there. So there's a lot of truth that's put into a fairy tale, as they would call it. And you have to be an adept to understand the true meaning to the allegories. So yes, they believe that, um, and just as they were talking about in the Da Vinci Code, they believe that Jesus did not die on the cross, that he was saved by Joseph of Arimathea, and why, and they cite, I won't try and justify their belief system, I don't believe it, but they believe this, that uh, even Pontius Pilate was surprised at how quickly Jesus had died. And their rationale is, is they took him off the cross and they uh, healed him back and then uh, hooked up with Mary Magdalene and produced, depending on which uh, legend that you're referring to, uh, at least three children. Some are less, but most are three, some are more. Typically three is the number. It's the third child that Joseph of Arimathea, who they would... Uh, also draft into their mythos, uh, takes the third child to um, Glastonbury, 
and this this child's name is Josephes, and Josephes will intermarry because of his Davidic bloodline into the Camelot dynasties. Uh, and into the Tuatha Dé Danann dynasties, into the King Arthur dynasties, and understand that King Arthur is son of Uther Pendragon, a Tuatha Dé Danann bloodline, and Guinevere uh, is would be the queen of the fairies, just as Guinevere means like a banshee or a spirit-like uh, being, as that, as that, and then this bloodline. Uh, as in their belief system, will cross over to the Merovingian bloodline through Aragon, who marries Aminabad, to graft that bloodline into the Merovingians. And then the last survivor, and it was the most ennobled bloodline of that time, the Merovingians, and included Anjou and uh, other bloodlines as well. But Dagobert is the last survivor of the Merovingian bloodline, and through that last survivor produces um, these Anjou bloodlines that we talked about earlier um, that claim the King of Jerusalem title. So you have three major bloodlines within the founding of the Knights Templar, uh, and they are uh, de Bullion, Godfrey de Bullion, uh, you have Hugh de Peon, and you have the folk of Anjou. So de Bullion as a and he's and they're from Lorraine. So when you know, I talked about von Habsburg's claim, that's through the Habsburg Lorraine dynasty that intermarried and inherited the King of Jerusalem title through that intermarriage and then passed on to the Bourbon line. And this is the Anjou of the Lorraine region, uh, as opposed to the the Anjou of the Hungarian region the Hung and the Anjou of the Naples region in, in, in Italy. Um, so you have bloodlines that are going to produce Anjou, uh, Anjou, bloodlines that are going to produce the Peon, and a bloodline that's going to produce the Bullion that are, are all interrelated from Dagobert, the last survivor of the Merovingians. These are founders of the Knights Templar. Uh, and they're not poor knights, they're all royal bloodlines, and the two monks that are in there are Cistercian, and of course their bloodline as well, because all of the educated monks were part of the bloodline elite. And Cistercian monks were Gnostics, moles within the Catholic Church, and were in part founders to this Knights Templar, this new Rosy Cross order that uh, of old that they that they um, restarted with uh, with the Knights Templar. And of course, de Bullion becomes the first king of Jerusalem. He doesn't accept the full king title, but his brother, because de Bullion dies a year later, um, Baldwin I does accept the full title, and that starts this whole succession. And Baldwin II is actually officially crowned as the king of Jerusalem in uh, 1018. And so all of this is 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 part of what is grafted into the bloodline um, story in the Da Vinci Code, that they believe that uh, they have the Jesus bloodline that's grafted in, that they believe they have the Davidic bloodline grafted in, that they have the Benjamite bloodline grafted in, and grafted into ennobled Nephilim and Rephaim bloodlines that will give them special status worldwide to be that dragon messiah so it is a fiction but it's telling you their belief system and it's their typical mo that they call the fairy tale and they believe in something that um sort of became a little bit more well known through a couple other gnostic writers uh tolkien and lewis and particularly in in uh, in Lewis's uh, discussions, but Tolkien said as well, is that this heraldic and fairy tale literature that they were involved in uh, included what they call a eucatastrophe. In, in fairy tales, you have a happy ever after ending because, again, it's a fairy tale, it's, but it's not the superficial narrative that's important. It's the meanings that they've embedded in to it and in this happy ever after fairy tale the hero finds a way 
out and lives happily ever after. And they only do that just to give it a good ending. But the eucatastrophe is, is that um, that never happens. And so it's to save the reader the distress of a, of, of, of a bad ending. So they look at the Bible as a fairy tale. And they look at it, you have to be a mystic to understand everything that's encoded underneath. And that the resurrection is a fairy tale. And it's only the principles that they're talking about. And that... Um, you know, Jesus eventually died. And the, and the eucatastrophe is, is that Christians created a mythos that he was resurrected into heaven, but in their belief system, he produced the bloodline. And they say they have evidence to, to produce this, and they're going to bring it out at, at the appropriate time to sort of bring Christianity to its knees, because as Paul said, if the resurrection isn't true, you know, that's the single sort of thread, sort of paraphrasing what he said, that our, that our faith is based on. So they're going to hit Christianity right at that most sort of vulnerable aspect and be very convincing in it. And this is part of that sort of preparation. And so uh, they'll also say things like that uh, to make their point that you need to interpret the Bible um, as opposed to read it literally is that They'll come out and they're going to say, and this is based on their writings, and I've heard some of it out in the marketplace as well over the last 10 years or so, is that the only sign that Jesus provided to that generation was the sign of Noah. And then they go on and say, you don't really believe Noah was swallowed by a whale or a fish or however you want to translate that and then survived somehow for three days and three nights and then was sort of belched up and went on to his uh, commission. They say it's a fable. It's a fairy tale. And that that's the sign that Jesus gave that generation. And so just as Jonah is a fairy tale and a fable, so is the resurrection. And then they'll use their dragon Messiah that's going to be raised up like the serpent was in the desert. Again, They'll start counterfeiting everything that Jesus was prophesied to do and, and counterfeit his prehistory and his credentials all as part of their own mythos. And it's, it's going to be a, a very elaborate deception. But understand that anytime they do their writings, anytime they do their art, anytime they do their music, they're encoding their beliefs belief system in it and it's for the people who have been brought through to be adepts and the higher you go at the adapt level the more you understand what's being communicated whether it's in that literature or it's in taciturn things like Rosalind Chapel or gothic cathedrals or the coat of arms they use it in plain sight um, to communicate and to I think laugh at us because they know we have no idea how much control they have and how they put everything in plain sight. I know that was a long rant, but again, it's, it's such a large topic that you can just sort of go on forever. But I think you kind of get the idea that there's much more going on in the Da Vinci code than anything else. And what's also interesting is that one last allegory. And I, and I should have put that in earlier is, is that if you look at the Lord's supper painted by Da Vinci, he's got in the background, like, uh, a triptych type of architecture, three different types of scenes and buildings. Those are portals. That's part of the occult belief system of portals into the other world. Then you have a female that's sitting opposite on the right-hand side of Jesus that normally would be John, uh, but it's a very feminine John. But again, they're encoding that as Mary Magdalene, and there's no grail or cup on the table. And that there's this V splitting Mary Magdalene and, and Jesus. And they're saying that's the grail. That's that female womb sim symbol of the grail. And the Holy Grail is an allegory for the bloodline. And that bloodline that's been grafted in for the coming Messiah or dragon Messiah. Gary, I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about Enki. Is Enki a good guy? Does he watch over humanity and protect humanity? And did he create humanity? 
well, that's what the polytheists and uh, ancient alien people uh, belief system would say. No, Enki is a fallen angel. Enki is uh, not uh, Satan, and Enlil is not God. Enki is an offspring god. He's very much like Baal or Osiris or, or Zeus. He's just from the Sumerian pantheon. He's depicted as a seraphim. And so he is somebody that would have moved up. One of the terms that we that I think Christians need to understand in the Bible is the term host of heaven. And that's the Hebrew word host, Saba, meaning an army. And so you have rank and order in that army. And if you have, let's say, like the parent gods who get sent to the abyss before the flood, then those underneath would just move up and be promoted to take over. And that's kind of what happens in the counterfeit Saba, the counterfeit um, host. And you know, they still report to Satan because he never went to, to the abyss. And it's represented in Psalms 82 for the council of the gods. And they rule over the 70 nations both before and after the flood. Uh, that's recorded in Deuteronomy 32. So it's important, it's important to, to understand that when we look at what happens in Sumeria with Enlil and Anki. They're both part of the pantheon. Um, and Anki doesn't create humankind. He, I mean, humankind is already there um, after the flood when he rules. Now, humankind was there before the flood as well, and he was around as well, but he just wasn't in, let's say, in charge. Um, and so Anki is thought to be, by a lot of people, to be Satan, but he's too low. Um if Anki, if you know, Anki would be more um, equivalent to an angel who would have been promoted to replace Azazel or Azazel, uh, the leader of the Watchers, as talked about in in the Book of Enoch, and likely Apollyon and Abaddon, who comes out of the abyss uh, in in Revelation nine. So uh, it would be more akin to a fallen angel like that, or the Nephilim, as I like to call them in, uh, in, in, in my new book. And Nephal is the root word for Nephilim, and it means fallen. And you put the I-M-L plural, it means the fallen ones, just as the seraphim or the serpent ones, and so on and so forth. So, yeah, Anki is not uh, a creator of humankind. Uh, he's a counterfeiter, and he's a secondary counterfeiter. He's somebody who took the place of uh, the parent gods, like gods like Anu, before before the flood. Now, going back to Enoch, the Book of Enoch, there's several characters in there. There is uh, Shemyaza, Azazel. And I always kind of wondered how these guys would correspond to the gods of the time. I mean, if you look at the Book of Enoch, or specifically the uh, you know the saga of the saga of the fallen watchers, it does seem very similar to what we're reading in these Sumerian stories and things of that nature. Um, would would like, for example, would Shemyaza be an, a new? D do I have that right? Um, well, first of all, I would say Shemyaza is probably Azazel, and that's one of the corruptions that would come down. Um, so Shemyaza doesn't end in E-L. Uh, Shemyaza is, is part of two compounded words from Shem, and short for Shemaim was part of the renowned ones of infamy or the, the heavenly ones as Shemaim is, is, the, is the plural for. And Yaza is... Arabic and a Zen word for an angel. And so it seems to have been a, a secondary title or a name, but it doesn't end in E-L, which it probably uh, sh should have ended with. And if you look at uh, Yaza, it's got, at, you know, Azazel sort of as part of uh, the word Semayaza or Shemayaza, and there's several different formats in, in, in the book of Enoch. And so the thought is, is that Azazel was split into two with 
translation corruptions over time in that they have similar positions uh, within the book of Enoch and probably should be thought of in as one angel. And I, I kind of con concur with that. So if we just sort of combine that down to uh, Azazel and the other six major ones, you always have sort of a, a seven major set of angels within the traditional 12. So you, like you have like 12 parent gods and then 12 offspring gods. So you have like 12 parent gods in the Greek mythology led by Kronos and Gaia. Then you have 12 Olympian gods after the flood. So you have kind of that, that constant. But there's seven that are major, like is as we would understand it biblically as the seven wandering stars. It would be uh, the same as the, the seven days of the week that those major gods would be named after. And uh, <clears throat> we see that represented in their imagery of, you know, uh, Saturn and Jupiter and the moon and Venus and those seven sort of major planets that are associated with the earth are associated with those seven major angels. And there's seven major angels that provided most of the illicit knowledge uh, in, in, the, in the book of Enoch. So I would be looking for Azazel to be like Kronos uh, or Anu or uh, gods like that, let's say El in the uh, Canaanite pantheon. And Baal is the offspring god of, 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 of El, as we talked about, who rules after the flood. And Satan would still sit above that because he's he has set himself to be like God and is looking for that counterfeit realm to rule on his own. So uh, before the flood... Azazel would be part of the Satans, and there would be seven Satans in, in the book of Enoch. And uh, so there would be six others that would be part of that seven wandering stars before the flood, and then they would be replaced by seven after the flood. Um, so that's sort of how I would sort of look at placing Satan and then Azazel. And then you'd have to, it really starts to get complicated as you get into who are the female um, gods with a, uh, angels out of the uh, out of the book of Enoch. It, but if you sort of look at it, that there's probably just one major pantheon around the world uh, and they just have different vernacular names, then you can start to get a little bit closer on that. But we don't have, I've not found in my research uh, enough information to go beyond linking, um, you know, Azazel with being like the head, the chief angel of the pantheon in each of the, uh, the other civilizations. What I can't sort of get to through the book of Enoch is connections as to deciphering the other six in terms of, um, who who they're represented in but they would be part of that major seven of each it's just like specifically which one goes to which one is not clear to me may i ask a question uh dr may robert ask... uh good to hear well, from you? you do you have a question for gary yeah how are you doing today gary mr wayne how are you doing very well thank you it's a pleasure having you on man i really enjoyed the discussion man you seem pretty knowledgeable Thank you. Uh, my question is this: It's interesting you brought up like the female archangels because I'm pretty I'm pretty familiar with them, like the Archei. That's what they call them, basically, in some circles. Mm -hmm. So you have like um you know you have um the archangel Make Michael and then his female counterpart is Archea Faith. But I'm, I want to go back to Genesis six where you talk about like the the sons of the sons of God looking at the daughters of men, right? And then having mm -hmm. these children, right? And then they were the heroes and renowned above, right? But it kind of yep. seems like it's leaving out another picture, right? Because if you want to, if you want to factor in all this other mythology, because sometimes you do, because I see you, you, you taking like you know the Anunnaki and you taking Enkil, you taking Gilgamesh, you bringing all these different mythologies, right? But didn't the goddesses yep. have? Didn't the goddesses have have sons and children that were heroes too? So it's safe to yeah, say goddesses. You, some of the goddesses slept with us too. I mean, certainly we, we get the. Yeah, we get we get that in Greek mythology and in Mesopotamian mythology. So uh, the best example is Gilgamesh. Um, and there's probably two Gilgameshes. One is before the flood as recorded in the Book of Giants. 
Um, and the other one is Gilgamesh after the flood, that's sixth generation and is son of Lugabanda, uh, king of Aruk, and the female fertility goddess Nin. And that would be sort of the classic example of what ones would be more famous with. But certainly in Greek mythology, they were very, very famous for um, having uh, uh, produced offspring as well. And it was interesting what you're talking about, uh, Michael's count, um, consort. And again, that's a that's a sort of a, that's a typical polytheist uh, doctrine that every male god or every male fallen angel had a female consort. So Tiamat and Absu, for example, Kronos and Gaia, they always had that. That's, that's sort of a, uh, a standard in polytheism is that part of the dualism that they have. I mean, that. you can say so, the same yeah. thing about, you can even say the same thing about Jesus and Mary Magdalene. I mean, like, I mean, it's just there. I mean, part of being a human being and consisting of like a male and female attribute, you have to have that. That's why I'm kind of I'm kind of in agreement with Nietzsche a little bit, because Nietzsche's famous for saying, I cannot love a God, or, or I cannot believe in a God who does not have a wife. Right? And this is the problem I have with the Christian perspective a lot, is because they leave this whole side out. It's just like, you know, we we come in here and we talk about like the sons of um gods sleeping with the with, with 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 the with the women of human beings basically and then we have and we you show certain other mythologies demonstrating that but then we have all this other mythology of these women kind of sleeping with these men too these goddesses sleeping with these men too and they were heroes too achilles is the son of a goddess right yep. and then he's he, he, yep. he's the son of a mortal man right and he's one of the greatest heroes in the yep. Iliad. i mean so we're just like missing this totally yep. feminine perspective you know, because we still have all these biases, you know what I mean? All this kind of like, um, what I say, like this kind of like, um, you know, you know, you're kind of hunt with these hangups, you know, but like, so when I hear somebody yeah, talk, I, I'm, not saying you're, I'm not saying you're doing this because you're not, but I'm just saying though, like, it seems like kind of, it seems too selective. Like we want to select and say, okay, we have all this here and we forget about this whole feminine side. And I think that kind of does so, a disservice to us yeah. in the way we're trying to really understand our world and the totality of it and all the meaning in it. But, but that's something I just want to bring up. Yeah I, would, to bring... yeah, I would part company on, on some things that you said and agree with uh, quite a bit of what you said. So um, gender is a physical world construct, in my opinion, in research. So you have uh, this feminine gender that, that angels can take or they can take a, a, a male gender. Um, but to say that God has to have a female consort doesn't really make sense. He doesn't He doesn't come physically into the physical world. He's of the spiritual realm, and he only has the word do what he wants, and it's done. He doesn't have to do anything to procreate. A lot of people like to mix the Holy Spirit as being the feminine aspect, but... Uh, again, that's a that's a physical world construct. Uh, I mean, the spirit well, beings, all... the spirit beings don't need um, a gender and don't need to procreate because they're immortal. It's in the physical world where mortals live that we have to procreate; otherwise, we would, you know, disappear. So, well, what, do you, well, what do you mean? But what do you mean? But what do you mean? We don't pro that they don't procreate. Look at us. Like to say, like, like, the, like the gods, you know, don't have this need to procreate. I mean, then why have a universe, and why have it like, like, you know, like overflowing with people and all these different other species and things like that? Yeah, I mean, like, I'm reminded of a poem by I'm, 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 I'm reminded by, of a poem by Rumi, and Rumi basically says, um, you know, it's, he's talking about David, and David goes, Lord, if you didn't need us, then why did you create two worlds? And God says I was a hidden treasure nope. that needed to be told. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm getting into that to say I can say the same thing. Like, like, like you know, everybody can say so to that. But I'm saying though, God doesn't. God can be male and. Female. Well, let me jump in and respond. So please, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so they don't. God doesn't procreate sexually, and with the fallen angels, with the gods, they take a physical form to procreate sexually god does not need to do that so when god says things are created 
So that's how that happened. So yes, he created humans, but that doesn't mean there was a sexual contact there, and it doesn't mean there had to be sexual cor correlation with a with with a female. Notice I didn't mention sex product. though. I didn't mention sex though. Well, and that, and that's what I'm talking about. Saying, but but, I'm saying well, I'm, let I'm, me finish. Look, look. Okay, okay, okay. Let me finish. In, in, in mythology, whether or not they're creating offspring gods is through sexual relations in the physical world, or they're creating demigods is through sexual creations. If they're creating little people, it's through sexual uh, procreation in the physical world. And they've taken a physical form to do that because naturally they're spirit beings from a different realm, but they interact Physically, in the physical world, they need to have an oikotarian, which is a dwelling place for that spirit, which is the body and the soul. And that's how that's why they procreate. But they they can't procreate spiritual beings in a spiritual realm. Well, so what would you say to I'm not trying to be contra. I'm just I'm just trying to have conversations. So I'll make that clear because, you know, yep. like I'm just trying to bring throw things out there and just make it clear. But yep. no, what would I you say I'm to just a clarifying the monotheism? No, and I love you too. I, lo I love you too. I, yes, and, yeah. I, and I have a question. Like, uh, so what about yep. like the physics? Who might make the argument and say like even physicality is a human construct? Like we're just these vibrations, you know? Like they say, like you know, like uh, we're ninety nine point nine percent empty space and things like that. You know what I mean? So like, so anybody come in and say, okay, well, are we really physical? That's just language. That's just how we as human beings understand these processes. And we give it a certain language so we can communicate with one another and understand each other and sort of kind of say, okay, you and I are seeing or witnessing these same phenomenons interact in what we perceive as an outside world, basically. But it's really, we're just all limited by language. Like I can say like it's sex, but then again, from my limited understanding as a human being, I'm framing it in a sexual context or insisting that sex has to be a vehicle and or the only vehicle in which female and male male um, um, energy interact. You know, so I just so I just not I'm not not sure you can actually make your case that way, but I get what you're saying because at one point they're just all beliefs anyway. Well, ultimately. One one will be right and one won't be. We'll have to wait and see on that. But it, it is a polytheist belief, though, that the uh, the physical world is a projection like a matrix. Uh, that is a standard polytheist belief. Biblically, we don't get that. Um, but we don't know how God created something from nothing. So it can start at that quantum level and build from there and it could be a projection uh we we just don't know um and again it's not that polytheism from a monotheist perspective disputes a lot with monotheism it just disputes where their gods fit and how they they have similar kinds of creation stories everything is kind of from a monotheist perspective it's counterfeited what the true god has done and that and that counterfeit will happen in some different ways uh, so whether or not the world is a uh, matrix projection where you could procreate as we saw in the matrix movies as well I feel um, you. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so yeah, um, that's a pos that's a possibility, but biblically we don't get that information. So I can only say from a polytheist yeah, 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 yeah. perspective, that's what yeah. they believe. But let, let, let me chime in here real quick. Let me Go chime ahead, in. Yeah. I just want to give my opinion on this. Like to me, and you can tell me if I have the right idea, Gary. There's a difference between these gods that are you maybe call them demigods, or they are pretenders, or they're they're pretending to be. The creator you know kind of like we were getting into anki a little bit um, there's this belief out there that he's the creator of humanity but that that may very well may be a deception but there's a difference between source which is genderless and and these demigods that do have an individual gender do i have that right yeah i mean the true spirit being has no gender um, they only take a gender because they can take any form that they want. They're, they're basically changelings. And so uh, a demigod is half human. So, but if, if 
and I don't know whether it's possible or not. I mean, from a monotheist perspective, I think that offspring gods weren't created. I think they're just part of uh, the hierarchy um, that was in place and were just at a lower level. I think it's probably an allegory. Um, but if they could, um, they'd have to create them in that spiritual realm it's somehow some way and they can't seem to do that but they can somehow procreate um a offspring god from a physically formed god and goddess and create an offspring god i i'm i'm not sure that that's actually what happens but that would create a lower level of god um that isn't capable of the same things in multiple dimensions that the spiritual fallen angel would have had the capability of doing and I, I didn't see that as a limitation with the offspring gods in the um, post-diluvian accounts but the demigods is very very clear that is the spiritual nature uh, of another dimension that takes a physical form to be able to create dna to procreate with a physical being and they get what they call a demigod which is defined in ancient ology as the offspring of a human female or human male with a god or a goddess and that these were lower level gods that were originally received that counterfeit spirit but as genesis 6 3 as i mentioned earlier talks about took that away and they've been trying to get that immortality back ever since and so they're <laughs> called demigods that we would understand as Nephilim or Raphaim or earthly Anunnaki, earthly Titans. You have a you you have to be careful in in um, how beings are called because you can have Anunnaki of heaven and the Anunnaki of the earth. And Anunnaki is also understood as a watcher as well. Um, mm -hmm. And you you can have the demigods being watchers, but they were representatives in the physical world as as watchers. So they're part of the hierarchy, but they're not as high as the god, and they're not as high or as a, as pure as the fallen angel. Mm -hmm. So what would you? Because um, I know there's some. I uh, kind of like you know because I was invited on here by my good friend Dan here, so I kind of like watch some of your YouTube videos, and I noticed you draw a lot from like Hinduism from time to time too. Like some of the Hindu gods and things like that. So what yeah, would you for, say for certain things? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So what would you say about like the Hindu belief where they kind of believe that like we as human beings and are the actual fiction that we don't exist, that the only thing that truly exists is God. You know, the God is kind of just like this, um, this divine self who's omnipotent, omniscient, you know, and he kind of gets bored we're kind of passing the time of eternity. So what he does, he becomes divine self who plays all the parts. So I'm God, you God, he's the props too. So all he does is basically split and then vibrates at different frequencies to create this drama called the universe and things like that. So it's really just this one thing and duality, what you want to call polytheism, all these things are actually the illusion. You know, because think about it, like when, when you and I are born, right, somebody just, you know, you're born, they said, okay, your name's Gary, right? And then they kind of like influence you with a set of experiences. You went to school, you did certain things, you realized you like certain things, you exposed to certain belief systems. And over time, you bought into this fiction of this thing called Gary, but you're impermanent, you know, you're temporary. So you're going to cease to exist. But that one thing that's breathing you, that spark. That's God, and that's everything. So, what do you say to a belief like that, basically? And then let's let's think about yin and yang too. You have like the female and masculine, you know what I'm saying? Polarities, and from the interaction of this dance of this at this dual source, all existing comes into being. Like, what do you say about that perspective? Yeah, and I wouldn't just sort of limit that to Hinduism. You have similar types of. Uh, beliefs uh, just worded sort of differently from a new age perspective it's it's called the divine essence that you were that you're referring to that um, and the divine essence is like a holy spirit i wouldn't equate them but that's why i say kind of it's like but it's like the ultimate sophia uh, as the Gnostics would would call that, and and it is the source of all knowledge, 
and 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 life um and it is sophia is the goddess in gnosticism that creates the 12 archons that they believe the god of the bible was from and went rogue and so again that you get the, that, that sort of constant in that, that in that 12 of the parent gods that we were talking about earlier um and so sophia is sort of above that but so sophia just as with the divine essence, just as with the divine Brahman uh, and other names for it out of, out of Hinduism, combined with another nebulous force to make things. And it's the same sort of doctrine that's in, 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 in polytheist religions. They just sort of word it a little bit differently. But what's interesting about the Hindu religion with that divine essence for just to boil it down to one name is that it is something that we're going to see in the end time because it works in all dimensions and it it communicates its knowledge um in 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 all dimensions through something that is called quantum entanglement and so the particle that a lot of people think that is being searched for, whether it's in CERN or other locations, is in part the Atman particle or the Atma particle that is part of that connection to this divine essence. I have that evidence that's real. Home, the Atman is real. That, that you make this connection to uh, this divine essence. And it's it's something that's going to be part of a technology to provide unlimited life and unlimited knowledge. I think with the, with the mark of the beast system that's coming at the midpoint of the last seven years, it's also something that is um, thought to be able to be done through ritual yoga, where you get yourself into that state where not only can you astral plane, but you can put yourself into that divine essence and receive that knowledge and, and, and that, and that wisdom. So this is something that I think uh, people should be more aware of whether or not you're pro the divine essence or not. Um, I think it's safe to say that there's, there's something like that, no matter which side of the fence that you're on, that's going to be coming in, into play. But from a monotheist perspective, seems I've been talking the polytheist side from a monotheist perspective, that would still be a counterfeit uh, of the Holy Spirit. And it would be a blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, just as creating a mother goddess would be a blasphemy when something that would not be forgiven but it's something that's going to be part of the universal religion that's coming in the end time this divine essence this brahman whatever terms that you want to put on it that people are going to be connected with it and it's this spirit that actually um, um comes into you to provide you that connection to that source as as, as they would yeah. call it so um do I think it's there? Yeah. Do I think it's what they say it is from a Christian perspective? No, but I recognize that it's probably there. I like that. That's a good answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have one more question for you. Speaking of that, um, we'll be back to the feminine thing. I forget the verse, but I know it's in, um, it's in Psalms, right? And there's a verse in Psalm, I think it might be Psalms 8, basically, where, where, uh, where it talks about wisdom. And you kind of get the impression that wisdom is a woman. And it talks about being there with God at the time of creation and delighting in all the things that God did. But the way it's talking about itself or describing itself, you know, or the way it's describing the world, you cannot help but get the impression that there's some type of physical presence, not a physical counterpart that's actually with this male counterpart that's witnessing this, seeing this male counterpart do all these things and then having a role to play once these things are manifested from the from the from 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 the divine masculine. You know, part of talking about in um in um in Psalms. I would be looking more for proverbs for what you're talking about. Um, I'll, I'll, it's no, no, it's proverbs. In... It's proverbs. Proverbs eight. Yeah, I think you're right. 
you're right. It's Proverbs. Yeah, and 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 more than in just chapter eight. So what's going on there is you get the word wisdom. It can be translated from a couple other words that's used. Uh, Sophia, in Proverbs like you're well. using Sophia. That's New Testament. I'll get to that. Um, <laughs> but in Proverbs, the Hebrew word is that for the female aspect is chakma. That's rooted in the male version, which is chakam. C H A K A M C H A K M A H. And to feminize um, a, a noun, you put an A H on it. You can put another one on it, but I won't go in deep into all of the sort of things that go on in, in the Hebrew language. And you have to be careful with that because it, you could say, hey, that means that's a female construct as it's understood in the physical world and therefore the Holy Spirit might be a female. And there's some Christian segments that will make that claim as well. Um, but if you look at other examples of that, so you have Elohim, which is plural for gods and also for God most high or the uh, uh, superlative nature of that re representing God. But there's also the power of God um, that is exercised and it's used with the A-H suffix. So you would have Eloi that is expressed that way. Another example would be Gibor, which is the single, uh, singular form of, of mighty ones. And the, the, the male plural is gibberine. And then you have, that's number 1368. 1369 is gibberah. And it's used for the word mighty, but in the application of it. So you have to be a little bit careful on that. Uh, I recognize the argument, but I also recognize there's an application to wisdom that's being talked about. Um, but whether or not you want to say it, say somebody wants to say it is a feminine noun that's been converted from a male noun uh, and that represents the Holy Spirit, that's a physical construct again and the Holy Spirit is spirit. So it's not really bound to a physical sort of construct. Now Sophia is the Greek word that's used for the word wisdom uh, that's used in the New Testament. That's just the name wisdom. Uh, but the, 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 the goddess which we talked about earlier which is sort of akin to the divine essence, uh, was named Sophia. Um, so, but the, if, if the uh, New Testament was translated in Hebrew, it probably would have been maybe Chakma or Chakam, depending on how they would want to translate the application there. But what's important to understand there is that um, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit who provides the wisdom is necessarily a physical um, uh, female. Uh, the Holy Spirit is exactly how it's described as, 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 as spirit um, and doesn't take a physical form from a monotheist perspective. But there are uh, there is a growing um, tradition in, in the Christian community that they are feminizing the Holy Spirit. I think that's kind of a unification of the religion more that's coming to, into the universal religion, but that's just my opinion. Mm. And what's also interesting is, is that um, philosophy is a very interesting word that is part, part of the wisdom of this world. And it's, it's the theology of the first three of the sacred sciences. And it means the love of wisdom or the love of Sophia, which is, so you can, again, which way do you want to take that? Probably both from a polytheist perspective. Um, but you have to, as a Christian, recognize that there is a female use of chakma as wisdom in the Old Testament. And you've got wisdom that is rooted in Sophia in, in the New Testament and connected with the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. But is that reflective? And I'll leave that for what other people want to believe. But is that reflective of a female nature as a physical construct in the physical world? Or is that the act, the action or the application of the wisdom? I lean to the latter, but I, I recognize the argument for the first. Groovy, I could dig it, man. I just want to see your head is that. <laughs> Thanks, Robert. 
Gary, I did want to ask you about the church. I mean, I've heard things all over the board. I've heard that the church is behind all of this evil that's going on as far as uh, the, the elite and the world banking system, et cetera, et cetera. And then I hear others tell me, no, no, Daniel, you have it wrong. The church is good. It is holy. It was here since the beginning. And it's just this corrupt element that has kind of, I guess, infiltrated it and corrupted it from the inside. Um, where do you stand on that? Well, I don't think the church, uh, if you're probably talking about the Roman church, if uh, if people are saying they're kind of running things, um, the Roman church doesn't quite have that kind of power. Uh, and they've been dominated by bloodline popes throughout most of their history. Any organization that's run by a human is going to be corrupted. Um, and so we have to be very aware of that. It doesn't mean that the scripture is corrupted. It just means the people who do evil things are the ones that are corrupted. So we want to make a, des a designation there. So do I think the Roman church is going to be play a, a, a large role in the end time? I think yes. Do they have a large role that's gone on in education and in banking through mostly the Jesuits? Absolutely. Uh, which is a, a Gnostic organization. Um, do I think they're going to be important in bringing about the uh, Babylon um, or the new Babylon, as it's uh, talked about in, in, in secret society writings? Absolutely. I think they're going to play a large role in that. But it's the bloodlines that control all of the politics, that control all of the money. Um, they have all of the wealth. Um, they control the religions. And they're the ones that are going to be bringing this apart. Does Do the Jesuits and a, a number of the, what I, what, what I would call monastic orders uh, within the Roman church have specific roles like the Cistercians and Opus Dei and other ones? Absolutely. But they all have a specific role, just like other secret societies outside the church. And so some people say the Jewish people have control. They are just one aspect. Mystical Kabbalism is only one aspect of that whole organizational structure. So one has to be a little bit careful in terms of who, how, who and what you're moving to the top of the apex that controls everything. There's a allegory that is used in, in the hierarchy, and it's... Uh, there's, it's, we're, we know it as two different kinds of trees. Um, one's the world, world tree, and that's more like a sort of a genealogical tree that has the roots that go down into the earth and into another dimension, which is Hades or Sheol, and receives its life from there. And it's the same genealogical family tree, so it follows the bloodlines of the spurious offspring. And then there's a tree that is like an evergreen tree, Oh, and that tree is kind of like an elm or an ash tree as well, uh, like an evergreen tree, let's say cedar of Mount Hermon, uh, just as you would have ashes and oaks and elms of, of Mount Hermon, uh, which is the Thelemic tree. Um, and it is a, a, a hierarchical order. It has trunk organizations and then has these branches that report into the trunk organization. So at the bottom of this Thelemic tree of the bloodlines, you have Freemasonry, and then above that you have Illuminati, and then above that you have the Rosicrucians, and you have the rising ones from the first three levels of the trunk organizations into the trunk organization at the lower level of the Rosicrucians. Top level of the Rosicrucians are bloodlines, and then you have the Council of 33, or the Committee of 300, then the Council of 33, and then the 13 families, and that's sort of the Western Thelemic tree, and then you have all these other organizations that branch into it. So Freemasons would be, you know, responsible for low-level societies. Um, you have like the uh, uh, the Illuminati society. They would have the. I'm trying to think of the uh, Bohemian Grove would uh, report into uh, the Illuminati as a branch, and it would have a hierarchy along that branch as well. Uh, skull and bones would report in there so 
and you have organizations like that going in at the top. So let's say let's move up to the committee of 300. So that's the Davos crew that reports in there, the Bilderberger organizations, the Club of Rome, uh, anything that's uh, in, in, in economic funds, international monetary fund, World Bank, that's all going to go into the committee of 300. And above that, you have organizations that are more royal bloodlines that are part of the extended royal families and knight orders that um, populate the council of 33 and the 13 families so organizations like that might be the knights of the seraphim for the uh, norse royal bloodlines uh, you would have the uh, golden fleece order of the anjou uh, the the uh, higher level of the uh, order of the garter in in the Windsor's group there's two groups there one's a low level one one's a very important powerful secretive one so they have those types of organizations that populate the top you have the Knights of St. John which is another one that only has uh, not the firstborn but other uh, <clears throat> bloodlined uh, siblings that would be part uh, of that organization so we need to sort of understand that there's a hierarchy there and the jesuits um, would report into either the, the uh, rosicrucians or the committee of 300 i think probably more the committee of 300 um, through the black nobility aspect of the italian black nobility um that would be you know you have a larger european black nobility nobility also known as rex deus but specifically the gens julia for the for the black nobility of italy would control uh the the jesuits and a little bit lower down and separate the black nobility from two different levels in italy you have that gens julia then you have another migration of merchants and bankers and royal bloodlines that came over from phoenicia uh, to places like florence and venice um, and uh, aren't considered within italy quite as pure but that's an internal argument um, but they they're really involved with the uh uh, organizations like the uh, the financial groups as well. So, um, so if you understand that sort of Thelemic tree and those roots go down into Hades, they receive their authority and their rule from 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 their heaven. Um, and we need to understand that there are more organizations around the world. That's just the Western ones, and that there are bloodlines and secret societies all over the world. And the Chinese have just as a complex type of secret society order and they also have bloodlines as well that are resurfacing through the Sha dynasty and you have Xi who's from the western bloodline who's in charge of the of China right now and uh, operating through those bloodlines and controlling most of the secret societies so this is something that is very confusing for people they tend to use a pyramid model that just doesn't account for for all the different organizations you might look at that with inside a specific organization but you can't use it for the larger one and the model that i was that i, I came across in my research was the thalamic tree and that comes from the greek word thalam thalam in the new testament which means god god's will and in their belief system the pantheon of god's will who run this world through the the council of the gods um and have have run it you know ever since the creation of humankind uh, so yeah i think uh, we have to we have to be uh we have to recognize that uh churches are powerful um they don't always do good things but those are the people they are not the writings and you should look at the writings and you should understand the writings uh, before making sort of any evaluation can you ask a question? Go ahead. What, what's the obsession with blood? Because right, I was listening to the discussion earlier between you and Dan. It seems like, like a heavy obsession with blood. Why? 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 Yeah. Why, why, why was the symbolism of blood? You know, then well, like it's, the, it's, then the vampire element too, because even Christ is like having us drink his blood and eat his flesh and things like that. Well, we're told biblically that the uh, life is in the blood. 
Um, so if you're talking about just the blood consumption that uh, Nephilim and Raphaim and secret societies do, they're trying to extend their life by drinking blood, and they're also trying to create greater sort of uh, cognizance, uh, greater uh, mental capabilities through uh, the consumption of, of, of blood. So it's important to them, and the giants began drinking that blood after they lost their immortality. Uh, and that was one of the ways they thought that they could uh, supplement it. It's also known as Starfire um, and several other different names and allegories that, that are out there. Typically, they would drink it through a, a grail or a chalice or a skull or something like that. So it's, a, it's very, very important. In terms of the bloodlines, how pure that bloodline is, that goes back to their original demigod, Raphaim Nephilim patriarch and to a specific angel how pure that bloodline is or how it's been ennobled with other pure bloodlinings in something they would call a scion is where they will fit in the overall hierarchy and so they're always trying to improve their purity and their ennobleness to be at a higher level. And so the Stuarts at one time were considered the most ennobled bloodline in the world at one time, at least from a Western European perspective. And the Merovingians were also claimed to have, be the most ennobled bloodline at one time as well. So it's just one of those things within the culture that they have uh, for several different reasons. But the bloodline is more the genealogy, right? The Like the Julia Gens or the Albi Gens. And it's very, very important. They also might call it the gene of Isis that they have that comes from the gods, that makes them that demigod, that produces a special kind of blood in that they seem to believe is the Rh negative. I think they might be right, but it's pretty hard to prove that. Uh, for example, the, uh, the the royal family of England is essentially O negative, and there's more. There's a very high level of concentration amongst the royals with Rh negative. And that was added through the gene as opposed to the bloodline being added because you can't add something that's missing. Rh negative is missing the D antigen, but it's the genes as in the gene of Isis or the fairy uh, gene that they also call it and other names as well. Uh, it's through the gene that would produce that particular blood type. And interesting indeed. I always wondered about the witch hunts that took place uh especially things like the the salem witch trials gary do these witch hunts factor into the story at all were they trying to kill the bloodlines of some of these people or perhaps were these competing bloodlines any thoughts on the witch hunts well you could you know, you could sit on both sides of the fence on this one. You could see that um, it was a overzealous and extremist religious, uh, monotheist religious reaction to a polytheist belief system because a witch is just a, 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 a priestess and a warlock would be a priest in, in the polytheist religions. So um, they could have been, that could have been a Christian purge or because certainly the Roman Catholic Church was known for its inquisition and, and, and things like that. Uh, so that would certainly uh, spill over into other uh, Protestant denominations that would have been part of those types of things. But you could also look at that within the rivalry of the bloodlines, they would be purging and overthrowing their bloodlines as well. And that could be a subterfuge for that. So what I would use for an example on what I'm talking about is there can only be one family that's going to eventually rule. So there's going to be, there's rivalries for this. And the Western Europeans concocted something uh, in the 1800s called social masonry. And then they uh, armed this social masonry with people like uh, Trotsky and Lenin. And at the appropriate time, they launched that on the uh, Scythian bloodline of the uh, Putyanin 
bloodline through the junior shoot of the Romanovs that set off the, set up the Moscow dynasty from Kiev um, with Vladimir the Great, and that's why Vladimir is honored by Putin. Um, and they essentially had a large disagreement with this uh, more pure Scythian bloodline uh, than what the Western Europeans had. So they, I would call it a virus that they let set loose there, and basically that whole bloodline was wiped out. That type of social masonry kind of after World War I resurfaced in, in uh, Germany, and basically the, the Kaiser bloodline stopped from having the power that they did. They, I mean, they weren't wiped out like the Romanovs were. Uh, and then that virus was set on the Chinese and the Li and the Xi uh, bloodlines were basically, you know, wiped out and taken from power, but not totally wiped out. And which is why we have Xi now resurfacing as, as, as the leader and probably going to be president for, for life. Uh, so you have those rivalries that are going on all the time within the bloodlines. You have the Basques who have the highest RH negative concentration, as high as 80%. They considered themselves in their mythos Homo Atlantis. Uh, and I'm not making this up. I have a great document on, on, on this if people want it or on RH negative and probably a number of other things that we're talking about today, people want to get a hold of me. So they believe that they survived uh, from Atlantis uh, after the flood and they repopulated Egypt, Scythia, uh, and Sumeria, and then settled in northern Spain and south southern France, and were the most purest of the antediluvian bloodlines with their survivability. So giants, basically. And that the Western Europeans who migrated out of the Middle East uh, moved in, but there was this power control and this jealousy over this higher position that the Basques uh, held. And uh, so you have the Basque diaspora. So those are just a few examples that you might have been referring to in terms of was it was it the bloodlines doing it to certain people or was it the church? Well, it's probably both, but uh, you can't just leave out what the bloodlines do to themselves in search of their own power. Now, does this blood have like a special effect on them psychologically or anything like that? Is it like kind of like the midichlorines in Star Wars or some shit like that? Like, does it do something to them that gives them some type of way of perceiving the world, a higher level of consciousness, a, a desire to dominate? I mean... Yeah, so if you look at Star Wars or you're taking that from, that is reflecting that whole belief system. And that whole Jedi belief system comes through a bloodline, right? And where those medichlorines yeah, provide that's extra just power. Start, and, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what they believe. So on the document that if people get a hold of me for the RH negative, people have RH negative have a lot of attributes um, through surveys uh, and many surveys. And some of them include like a higher level of uh intelligence so 140 plus on the iq yeah. um, they have you know more red hair uh and pale skin and more blonde hair and more hazel eyes and blue eyes um, they have more occult interactions whether they're you know and and not sort of uh, ones that you would go out of your way to have it, but sort of spontaneous that it happens with them. There's something in the uh, that whole gene belief system that they call um, the hive mentality. And of course, at the top of the hive is the queen bee. So it's that Sophia, that divine essence that we were talking about earlier. But they believe that when your bloodline is pure and it's closer to the original, that you have more telepathy capabilities, that you can communicate um, without talking, and that originally all of the spirit's offspring could work with one collective hive mind, and that that allowed them to accomplish large goals that you couldn't do um, 
on, on, on your own as singular. And that hive mind is one of those things that they're wanting to recreate with that connection to the divine essence again down the road, but through a technological aspect by the sounds of how technology is going about connecting into that. Um, and what's also interesting is that this hive mind, it's, it's like thinking with like minds. So what's interesting about the Antichrist um, in Revelation 17, it says these 10 bloodline kings at, in, in the end time with like mind are going to hand their power over to Antichrist. So you get that sort of reflection of that biblically. And another interesting thing biblically is that when the Israelites in the uh, Exodus were warring with the Raphaim giants and the hybrid giants like the Amorites and the Canaanites and and that so there's two sizes of giants i talked about i go into this in great detail in my new book but they were thought to be working with that hive mind and that not only was their size and their technology great but that ability to organize an army using that hive mind and that's that midi chloron thing that we're talking about but it's interesting that god provided hornets to deliver up the giants and the hornet is the natural enemy of the bee and you just can't make this up and the fleur de lis is thought to be you know partially going back to the lily in their coat of arms but it's also stylized as a bee to reflect that uh high mentality that they believe that they once had and they're trying to get back interesting i know that um that beehive symbol symbology is a lot oftentimes tied to Masons and Merovingians and people like that. But hey, I did want to ask you, Gary, about HP Lovecraft. Have you ever researched Lovecraft and is his take on these type of Cthulhu beings, are they similar to these fallen angels or gods that we talk about? Yeah, I've not done a lot of research. I've kind of superficially you know, come across it. Th this fellow seems to have had significant knowledge that is, uh, was provided to him or he's way up there. And I have no reason to doubt the different uh, levels in the hierarchy of beings that he refers to and the darkness of some of those beings uh, and those creations. It's, it, it's, uh, but I haven't done an, enough research to, uh, sort of make connections into where they might fit in and things like that. So, um, but I, I suspect he has inside information or he, uh, he was of quite high level, but typically when, when they're doing these types of writings, that information is being fed to them by the bloodlines. Hmm. Yeah. That, that would make a lot of sense considering, uh, who, who he was friends with and some of the other um, kind of uh, racially motivated things that he said that he, of course, later apologized for. Uh, I did want to ask you about Lucifer. It seems like these secret societies, at least I know um, a lot of these witch covens, uh, they teach you about all the gods. And uh, as you ascend their ranks, they eventually you get more into Lucifer and you, you start believing that Lucifer is God why are these people, these elite people, secret society people, magic, occult, black magic people, why are they so enamored with this idea of Lucifer? I, I know he's more of like a, I guess you could say a modern creation, being that a lot of his imagery came from the, the church or people that were affiliated with the church um, not that long ago, not, not ancient times or anything like that. But is there like a an Anunnaki god or uh, maybe somebody from Enoch that would correspond to Lucifer. Um, who, who do you believe Lucifer is? Well, Lucifer is an Italian name that's associated with uh, Venus. Um, so it's not a name that, that fits biblically. It shows up in the King James Version Bible, but it's a, uh, an Italian word inserted for a Hebrew word into the English language. So... It's actually Hail-El is the word that should be uh, used there, H-E-Y-L-E-L. Hail-El Ben-Shakar is the Hebrew for 
uh, Halal son of the morning. And uh, Lucifer is understood in masonry as one of the names for the God of the Bible. Um, and I'm not for the God of the Bible, I'm sorry, for the God of the Masons. And they also have another name for him. It's the great architect of the of the universe. Uh, he is the leader of the fallen angels. He is considered equal in their belief system to the God of the Bible. And so again, in their system, and we'll use the uh, Gnostic one with Sophia, uh, who created the 12 archons that the God of the Bible that they uh, in Gnosticism says is part of those 12 and he went rogue. So he's no powerful than any of the other archons, uh, or at least not the archon that would be associated with, uh, with Satan in, in Gnosticism. Um, so they're considered equals and they both lead angels. It's just, you know, which side do you think they are? Um, it's kind of like that allegory, you know, in the, uh, in Star Wars that we're talking about the, uh, the force good use for good used for evil. And there's dualism and polytheism on that as well, but this is a macro level. And so Satan is thought of as an equal and is a perpetual war with the God of the Bible that nobody can ever win. And so they're taught that, uh, the God of the Bible is real. He's just evil. And he caused things like the flood and he keeps humankind in ignorance and, he doesn't have the best of humankind uh, in mind for them, whereas Satan does. And so in the lower orders uh, of the of the secret societies, they will use allegories for Satan. And it's usually a sun god. So Osiris in Freemasonry is an allegory for the great architect of the universe, an allegory for Lucifer. And in... Satan probably has at least seven different names. Uh, we get Gadrael, Wall of God, in the book of Enoch as the one that was in Eden. And he's a very unique angel because he's partly seraphim um, who is described as a dragon and a serpent in Revelation 12. And he's also described as a cherubim in Ezekiel 28. And he's also described as a prince or an archangel uh, as well. So he has many attributes. He was likely the high priest biblically with the, the jewels he had before God, before he rebelled. And so he's more powerful than all the other angels because of all of his titles and things like that. And he, he, he maintained that even after being degraded to Satan status. Now, polytheists would not say he was degraded, that he's still as powerful as that. Um, so Satan, uh, is, is, is how we would understand the degraded aspect of Hail L or whatever his other names are. And that in that belief system, they teach that he is the equal and they need to fight the evil God of the Bible to have a realm of their own and to live away from God where the pantheon of gods led by, uh, Hail L will, be their god so it's it's the same sort of hierarchical setup but just in a different realm but they promote satan or degrade god to be at the same level as as the great architect of the universe so hopefully i explained that well enough for you 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 you, you, you know that reminds me of a little bit Sounds like you're describing Zoroastrianism a little bit, like her Mazda. Yep, you got it. it just sounds exactly what that sounds like. Uh, yeah, you yep. know, I get tongue tied sometimes. It's kind of never Zoroastrian. That's exactly what it is because it's like good and evil, kind of like these equal forces are kind of like you know, like dark matter, light matter, and they're constantly at war with one another. And through these battles, basically, yep. like they create all these new different things. It's like this constant yep. fight, a, a never ending battle, a never ending saga. Of good ego. Yep. In fact, I think um, Armon is sometimes from Zoroastrianism. I believe he's portrayed at times as a giant snake. Yep. Now, Gary, so 
this whole thing about Lucifer and all this, I, I know another one of the main things that they teach in these secret schools, this world of witches and wizardry, they all seem to believe that Jesus Christ and Lucifer are the same entity. And my personal belief is this is an extreme deception, perhaps one of the most powerful underlying uh, motivations for these people in, in a way that they often are able to trick Christians and good God believers into falling into this world of black magic and corruption. Uh, what would you say to that? Is is it, it, Do I have this right? Could Jesus be Lucifer? Or is this going back to the, um, the deception of the dragon Christ or, or dragon Messiah or Antichrist? Yeah, I think it's 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 some of both on that. And so typically as I as I, I have the arguments that are thrown at me on that topic, it would be that um Jesus would be um not Satan, but answering to Satan. And and a little bit lower than than Satan. And they they get at that sort of biblically um, with Isaiah 14, where you have Lucifer, son of the morning, uh, or the morning star, uh, and that uh, the reference is is that the morning star is referring to Jesus and to Lucifer, but with Jesus being like an extension of Lucifer, like the word is an extension or a branch of God in that sort of understanding. Uh, what's interesting, though, is as you see the, the pretzel making going on between the languages of Hebrew and Greek and different translations is that uh, the, it's... Kind of can it, it's kind of using an allegory of Venus as the morning star that is also associated with um, Lucifer and with Satan, and the morning star is it's also an evening star, and there was two gods, like say in Greek mythology, that represented both. One, uh, one was the morning star, one was the evening star. And you only have the morning star for six months of the year, but there's also an order of morning stars that Satan was also partly, I think in part, part of that morning star order. And so the difference is, is that they conflate the title of son of the morning with Jesus being called the morning star in revelation and then they sort of seed that sort of doubt now antichrist is going to claim to be the true messiah and that jesus was just a mortal prophet like confucius like buddha like zoroaster sent on the way to help humankind to evolve into godhood and that he will uh, antichrist will claim to be the true uh, Messiah, and he'll be the one that will be raised up like Jesus was said he would be raised up like the serpent in the desert, right? And he'll be the true dragon or the serpent of that raising up, and he'll have a counterfeit resurrection because he will uh, receive a mortal head wound biblically, and uh, he will counterfeit everything from a monotheist perspective from the polytheist perspective, he will perform for the first time. And he's the Antichrist, not as the opposite or the enemy of Christ, as Christians understood, but understood from the alternative meaning in polytheism to the one who came before Jesus. And the original and his return is coming back as the true return and coming again before Jesus would come, right? Because he'll have the stage to himself because Jesus biblically comes three and a half years after Antichrist is crowned in, in, in the temple. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of all of that. But look at all of that being in 
being conflated to create the pedigree and the credentials of Antichrist. But be careful because there's going to be multiple Antichrist. Kind of like they would protect the president. Kind yes. of like they would have layers of security around the president. The Antichrist will have a thousand layers around him. And there'll yeah, be well, and that's, people that will attempt. There'll be numerous people that will attempt to get him, right? But there'll be a yeah, thousand then, rings around him. Yeah, and uh, that's written about in the, uh, the protocols of, of Zion that he will appear to be out mingling with the masses, but all the people in front of him are his followers just to protect him. Kind of like, so, have you seen the pictures of Joe Biden where they're, they've got him from behind? It looks like a guy's got a rubber mask on his, his, his head. His <laughs> his have you seen those? I saw that. Yeah, I, I saw haven't. That. Oh, oh, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't seen that. But uh, there's people that think there, there's like I six Joe Bidens or something. Well, who knows, but you'd think that they right. would uh, get ones that were a little bit more competent. Well, <laughs> with that face, you don't have to try too hard because it just looks sad, you know. Just make a sad mask and you've got Joe Biden. Um, I, I was wondering if I could mention something real quick. I'm talking about back to the Antichrist. Go ahead, Dr. Robert. I, I had a friend in, in college had a theory about that. He was talking about actually like, you know, the Christian depiction of Christ in the Bible, he was actually arguing that that was the Antichrist. Basically, with the Bible, the religion they were giving us, they were giving us the blueprint and the belief system that would make us susceptible to the manipulations of the Antichrist. So then, yeah. when they, so when they tell you like this is what he is, this is what he looks like, this is what he's the same thing like in Voodoo. Sometimes I don't know if you saw that movie, like it doesn't work unless which, you believe in it. So what they which do one? first? Which movie? I think the movie where they were still in the bodies. It had Kate Hudson in it. Kate Hudson. Yeah, like body thieves, basically. First, like oh. they had to like get her in there, and she started having like all the. First, she didn't believe, but then uh -huh. like they kept telling her about voodoo, like giving her mythology, and then all Kate these Hudson. weird. Oh yeah. Coincidences yeah, would I, occur. I almost remember to... the name of the movie. Remember anybody remember the name of that movie? I don't remember the name. Of the... I don't remember the name Kate of the movie. Hudson. It's really good. It's really well yeah. done. But, Sounds but, familiar. But, but it, it was down in Louisiana, down, yeah, down yeah, in yeah, the yeah, yeah, of course. They're messing yeah, around yeah, with voodoo mythology. Yeah, They're yeah, messing yeah. around with voodoo mythology. But, but they were just basically giving her like a set of experience. First, they gave her like the actual, like the mental software. Like you download like things in the computer, basically. Like the actual, up, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the actual structure, basically. And then they start mm -hmm. subjecting her to a series of like little experiences that would confirm that belief, like confirmation bias. So then right. she finally believed in it then they were able to actually do what they needed to do to be able to take her body from her. And it kind of seems the same way, basically. Like they give Magic it works like that, though. Magic yeah, exactly. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. yeah, they actually First, you got to believe. But magic yeah. doesn't work on people that don't believe, for one. Or they give, Christians, right? They give, Christians yeah, they give you, they give you the, belief, the armor they, of God. They give you the belief system first, and then they yeah, recognize they that belief system against you. Yeah, that's what I'm saying, basically. You know, if yeah, you're doing they, a mental... If you're throwing yeah. somebody, somebody mentally... Yeah. You got you work on them mentally. You got to yeah. you convince them. It goes back to Sun Tzu. Yeah. Sun Tzu said it's better to not even step into the arena if there's going to be a fight. Convince your opponent he can't win. But well, see, but then it goes back again to where like we talked about the Bible talks about like don't make any images of me because even like when, when when you when you tell Christ's story, even though it's not like an idol or anything like that, you're technically through words. And through like abstract symbols, creating an image of God. And once you create that image of God, then you're able to use that image, that concept, that belief, all the language, all the you're mythology. You're talking about the archetype. You're talking about yeah, the yeah. Archetype. Uh, I, I think what he's trying to say is like a graven image yeah. is is kind of like an alternate version of the Christ story. And what he's yeah. what he's speaking against is Sacrifice. some of these um, dragon messiah type of doctrines. Is what what do you think of that, Gary? Well, there's there's a lot talked about there, that's for sure. Um, so, I think uh, it's creating <laughs> an image physically that they're talking about biblically. But I recognize the understanding that once you get an image, you have to be very careful in your even in your head in terms of what you do with that image. I think that 
when things come down to the end time, the last seven years from from and and the end of the age as uh, the end is of in day. all the different religions, um, there's there's going to be a single choice: this side or that side. And that it's important that people understand that. And no choice will be a choice. You'll be spit out by either side. Um, and just you need to get informed so that you're ready for whatever that decision would be if we're in the end, end time. Uh, because, you know, it's going to come down to that. It's going to be, is this uh, guy uh, the Messiah or is that guy the Messiah? Hey, Gary. Now, in this image, I want to just get back to this image thing just for a second. Um, so Antichrist actually makes an image of himself that's going to be part of this whole B system and this whole high-tech system that's going to interact into the different dimensions uh, and into the divine essence. Um, and then people are going to have that mark. They're going to be able to connect right into that whole system. That's what I was referring to earlier. But what's interesting about that uh, image um, and it's very associated with graven and a few other Hebrew words, but there's one word that is just perfect for it. And it's called teraphim. Teraphim? And that it, teraphim or teraphim. And it's in the Old Testament Bible for something really peculiar. And it's for, sometimes it's, it's listed in King James as teraphim and sometimes it's listed as idol. And idol goes back to a couple of different meanings, but this is a talking idol somehow there was an ability to Hologram. create this oiketarian that dwelling place for the spirit within this idol that was associated with certain families that they could speak in to this this sort of divine wow. presence or godly yeah. presence and that that'll be this the trippiest, be, that'll yeah, be the trippiest be, thing you've ever seen in your life hey hey yeah. gary have you ever been and, to and the is going to be that Talking teraphim, only from a technical sort of basis. Gary, have you ever sat around a Ouija board with anybody? Uh, no, I refuse to do no. that. Right. Yes. I have. Uh, but I've watched twice, people on it. <laughs> once or twice, the information yeah. that came through was so accurate and so like, whoa, it, it shocked and rocked me. Yeah. So, So I'm just saying. There's a possibility that I've seen, not every day, once in my whole life or twice, I'm 56 now, I saw something yep. that I couldn't explain, or information, yep. it had access to all the information of the universe, and what are you to stand up against that, right? Your brain yep. just rocks from that, yep. something has access yeah, to all the information. Yeah, so when you when you're using a Ouija board, is who who or what are you communicating with? Because you are well, the group was thirteen people. The group was thirteen yeah. people at the time, and they weren't witches. They, what they weren't witches, you know, by definition. They don't have to be, but they don't have to be. But they were people. But yeah, you they weren't were people communicating with them. In the future. Yeah, yeah, but you weren't right. communicating with they them when two. you were receiving this information. No, they had two women that were channelers. That could channel yeah. the information. Real quick, not everybody exactly. gets on a Ouija board. Exactly. Real quick, go uh, kart yeah. Bob so, in the so chat that's... says they give them beasts a mouth to speak. Sorry, I just thought that was an interesting comment. The, he said what? Yeah. He said they give the beast a mouth to speak. They give the beast yeah. a mouth to speak the Ouija board. Mm. I think you're talking about my, the uh, my point. Was, so. My point was once or twice in my life. I yep. saw information come out of the universe, come out of no yep. uh, a channel that knew everything that was speaking about things that it couldn't. That's either that's either demons that are providing the information or a direct connection with the divine essence that we that we talked about earlier. Yeah, none of these people were Christians, so that's probably demons. And this brings up another. Or maybe some more. I don't know. This brings up another interesting idea. The whole concept of artificial intelligence, virtual reality, artificial intelligence created worlds and images and music and vocal patterns. Gary, could this be the the, the false reality or the counterfeit uh, kingdom that you were talking about earlier? All this uh, AI stuff. 
Oh, I think it's going to be change the world, world fundamentally. It's going to be implemented into the B system and AI is going to be part of that image. And this technology is also providing a, a, the ability to go uh, multi-dimensional. So it's going to, it's also being worked with quantum computing. That's why you've got AI and quantum computing being used at places like CERN so that you can go interdimensional because to connect interdimensionally with the Atman or the divine essence, you have to be able to do that. And you need the AI to do those searches and to be able to do the things that they're going to need to do. It'll also link in that cryptocurrency with it in as well. So I don't think it's an alternative reality. It may be used to help pacify people and to go virtually so that they can be more easily sort of controlled and, 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 and led astray. But this AI is creating this oiketarian as well. Um, and you have these algorithms and AI that are working a designed agenda and they call them Deamons, the root word for demon. I, I'm not making it up. It's it's just a, a, a term that they use for those types of uh, AI algorithms. This thing is going to uh, have significant power. It's going to do, it's going to be able to supply significant knowledge. Um, it's dangerous. I think it, it could be. Uh, I'm not so sure it's going to be existential in terms of like the Terminator movies, um, but it's going to be used for one side or the other, uh, depending on which side that you're on. I'll leave that for people. I, I think it's going to be used to bring about this, this uh, uh, world government and this world religion and that Antichrist ultimately takes over. So I think it's, uh, it's ne necessary. Uh, you look at the Davos community that reports to the, the Committee of 300. They said in 2017 that the implant system is going to be connected to this type of interdimensional uh, uh, system, and they're going to deliver it through the healthcare system. Uh, that's going to be the delivery system to the world because people are going to want to be cured from diseases. They're going to want to be uh, have. Uh, immortality, to live longer, to be stronger, to be better. And this implant will provide them that connection to the Atma that's going to be able to do that for them. And so AI is a significant piece of all of that. I think AI is going to be within the, uh, the Terraform image of the beast because it has the ability to control uh, what people do. And if you don't take the mark of the beast it will hunt you down and it will slay you so behead you so this thing is uh is probably going to be operated by demons it's what's interesting as well in the book of revelation is that um it says uh, at the time of the gathering uh, for armageddon out of the mouth of satan antichrist and uh, the false prophet will come demons to gather the armies with miracles to gather them for, for war. You could also translate that as not as demons coming out of them, that they control, they command those demons to do those things. So I think that might be a little bit better translation, just as it will control, they will control those demons in that terraform that will have that AI. I think it'll have demons operating through daemon algorithms um, to, to, to work in that sort of system. I think that um, the, uh, when you look at the devil, as he's understood in Revelation 12, he's also called the serpent and the dragon, but the devil is defined as the leader of the fallen angels and the leader of the demons. Antichrist is like Horus of the, of the Osiris, Isis, trinity allegory that we talked about within the gnostic secret societies and that antichrist will have the power given to him as it's talked about in revelation 13 and in 2 thessalonians 2 from the dragon and from satan um, and that the false prophet will be provided that power as well so having that power and being like the son of 
the Satan God from a biblical perspective will have the power to command those demons through AI as well. I have a question for you. Um, you have a very interesting take on what demons are and how they actually came into existence or what caused the existence of uh, demons. I think you said they're kind of like, they kind of like come from like decay giants maybe or something like that. Or, or, am I getting yep. that wrong? Yep. Can, 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 would, yeah. you, would you mind elaborating on that more? I'm curious about that. Yeah, so in, in the book of Enoch is the best example that the disembodied spirits of the Nephilim are the evil spirits. And they're the unclean spirits. And that they are the counter. So the Nephilim, spirits. the Nephilim are the bodies that, that you said disembodied spirits. Yes. That means the spirits, they have no bodies, they're floating around. Yes, because right? the body died. The body died, right? The body and died so, in a war, in a war, or some weird thing. How? Why they ha their body died? Yes, they lost well, their body. Genesis six. Well, they were killed in the battle. Oh, that the battle of heaven. heaven. Yeah, it would be so the it, angels it, that were sent down to kill them. Sorry. So in Genesis six three, the life of of giants were limited, uh, as with the life of humans, and. That's because of that counterfeit spirit gave them an immortal body as well in the physical world, which was a violation against the Holy Spirit and um, the laws of creation. So when their bodies died, that's the oiketarian, the soul and the body of the physical world. The spirit comes from somewhere else. It was a counterfeit spirit. It's not the, God, the spirit that was sent by, by God. Uh, and biblically, we're told there's spirit, soul, and body. Okay, um, and that human spirits sleep when we die. But because they have that counterfeit spirit, they're not permitted into heaven and they're not permitted to sleep. So they only go to three different places. Now, if the worst of the ones went to the sides of the abyss, I think I mentioned this earlier in, in as Ezekiel 32 and Isaiah 14 talk about, uh, with the fallen angels being in the center of that tube in, in the abyss. And the worst death that, and the extirpation texts are really good on this, but we get lots of examples. The worst possible death, a royale uh, or a nephilim, knowing royale it comes from kings of God. Al is a transliteration of El for an angel or a god, Roy being king, um, with that divine right to rule and that whole bloodline thing that they have going. Um, the worst way they could die is beheading. Just like vampires, when it's how you kill them is you behead them as part of that whole allegory. And that's because they were thought to be able to heal themselves. And the Raphaim uh, is the best way to get where we understand that. So Raphae, Rapha is the singular form, and you have 74, 95, 74, 96, and 74, 97. 97 is the giant. 96 is the, is the evil spirit. And 95 is healing as in medicine or self-healing. And it, they're all interrelated and have partial meanings. And Raphaim and Nephilim were thought to be able to heal themselves. So if you cut off their arm, they could grow a new arm. So the only way to kill them was to kill them suddenly where they couldn't repair that damage, either naturally or through sarcophagi, as so other people would suggest that. They're known in the Ugaritic text as well as being healers of themselves and of other people. As well as giants and as well Interesting as Interesting on that. Can I uh, interject there? Sure. Yep. You know what's interesting on that? You know what other species has the ability to heal itself? The worm. Yeah. Or certain octopi yep. can regrow yep. arms. And they're connected yeah. to uh, they're connected to octopus can change colors and shape shift almost. Yep. Not yep. shape shift. Or... Lizards and baby crocodiles too. Have that ability yep. to blend with the yeah, environment. That sort of that sort of seraph. That dragon mode sort of... again. That dragon mode yeah. again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um if th that happened to them, they would go go to the to the abyss. And it was the worst thing that could could happen to them. Or if they um uh, so they were either going to go there, wander the earth, or find a way through their rituals and die the right way and taken into, into Hades or Sheol. Now, mm. what's also interesting is that 
Um, you have these evil spirits talked about in the New Testament. You have uh, unclean spirits. And you have in the King James Version uh, the word devil. And that devil is, 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 goes back to the Greek word daemon, root word for demon. And these are the ones who possess people. And you have devil as in daemon used with unclean spirits and uh, evil spirits. And all three of them are used in interchangeably the, in, in those accounts. In ahead. the Greek definition, they didn't use daemon as an evil thing. It, the Greeks yeah. didn't, daemon wasn't an evil word. It was more like a, a heavy supernatural, like a, like a super experience yeah. more yeah. than yeah, Socrates and, and, claimed to have one and, and act, remember Socrates had a day and, ac and, and yeah yeah access by adepts right mm. who had mm -hmm. the knowledge to be able to communicate with them and uh, perhaps even control them but to receive additional knowledge absolutely well Solomon's um, temple he built so, it with 72 demons uh, no but Socrates has one Socrates says demons. he has a day mom. Socrates says it yep. all through all the time. Yeah, Socrates has has a a a a yeah. That's where the word came from. Yeah, Socrates has one. Yeah. You know what's interesting too? Uh, I don't know. Are you familiar with Anne Rice? The vampire writer, fiction yeah, yeah. writer. I, I, she, had, she wrote a book called Queen of the Dam, right? And in that yeah, book. Yeah, they made a movie. Yeah, in too. that book. But the book is different though. You read the book in that book, which you're talking about like the Nephilim demons, is exactly how she describes vampires came into being. In ancient Egypt, and the there, blood. Was a, there was a spirit that liked to taste the blood. It would nick them, and it liked to taste the blood. And then right. something happened where, like, the king got cut or, like, something assassinated, and the demon infused because it liked to taste the blood with the, with, with the king. And that kind created like, the whole, kind of, the like whole how, race. kind of like how all the temples on earth, if you go back to ancient, ancient cultures, they're all set up for blood sacrifice. Sacrifice the person the blood pours down into for, into holes. Given these, yeah, this is this portals. is very eye opening. I have to admit, this whole <sighs> idea of these false gods or um, archons or whatever label we have for them not being truly immortal, but needing a war and bloodshed in order to sustain their long lives. That really gives me a whole different perspective on this whole yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah, they're megopotent. They're not omnipotent. You got omnipotent beings, and you have megopotent beings. Megopotent yeah. beings—they're just better than our asses. They can fuck us up. Yeah. <laughs> the people, um, uh, one thing Gary Wayne's talked about here tonight is hierarchy. Whoever these suckers are, they got a hierarchy of demons and families and 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 orders and instructions and rules. So the people in the lower levels have to do the dirtier stuff, right? Like be president. Literally, that's a lower yep. level now, being president of the United yep. States, which is the most powerful country on the world. That's a lower level. Wow. Holy shit. Um, but um, there's people down on lower levels that do the other things for them, you know, like the lower ranks that keep yep. this thing marching yep. on into space. That's why when Joe Rogan talks about machine elves, you know what the machine elves are? They're the things that the elite put into – put. In, been here before before the elite and they operate they keep running pushing us towards whatever this thing is it's hard to explain unless you've seen beyond the veil yeah and that's something you see also with dwarves they're they're said to live in underground places and be involved in machinery and also um, yep. santa santa claus Behind and his scenes. elves where the elves are the workers for Santa. Some people say that Santa is Satan. Um, I, I, you know, I, I'm not sure if I'd agree or disagree well, with that. And then living Santa. in the north, and then living in the North Pole, which perhaps also has some kind of mythological si significance to all this. Kids are taught to hide from Santa. If he sees you, then you've messed the whole surprise up, right? So the if he so the if elementals. you see him, then you mess the surprise up. So the elementals are the lowest level in the hierarchy and the hierarchy split into the uh, visible ones and the invisible ones. And the visible ones tend to be the uh, physical 
procreative, uh, procreated offspring. The elementals at the bottom are made up of four different groups of three different uh, little people, one being uh, the ugly ones like uh, gnomes and trolls, uh, and you have uh, the good looking ones, uh, and then you have the mischievous ones, and it's the same um, three breakouts for the little people on all continents around the world. And then there's a fourth classification of elemental that are the salamanders and are kind of reptilian and are a little bit taller than humans. Uh, so the salamanders would be a little bit higher than the elementals. Within the elementals, each one had a specific function. So when you see like Lord of the Rings where you have the dwarves that are in the earth or in the mountains making weapons for the demigods, that was their role. Everybody had a role. So you had like other ones in the ugly ones like the gnomes who looked after the technology, the genealogy, uh, and had uh, ability to have you would call it a UFO that comes through portals and they would do kidnapping of people. And their, their description is exactly like uh, the gray aliens and they're called grays, uh, the gray gnomes. Um, and so it's sort of, that's the lower end of the physical hierarchy. Nephilim are, are higher up. Um, and then as you move up, you have all of these ranks and orders of angels. And you know, we talked about the four at the top, but there are like the Dunamis and you have the uh, Ascurus and you have uh, names like that that are below that rank of the watchers. There's like three major columns. Uh, one kind of breaks into two under the seraphim, but you've got... Uh, three major columns that come down and so you've got a mid-level of of angels and then you've got like the messenger angels and the soldier angels uh which are at the the bottom of that hierarchy and they all have a role as well so it's like an army and it's broken into the ones who represent them on earth and uh, those who are invisible, who are providing that knowledge, providing that guidance, and uh, they're known by many different things. And the demons are also in that mix um, because that's the disembodied Nephilim, right? So um, they're the ones doing a lot of the communication to the humans for the higher up. Gary, can I ask you a question? Sure. Have you been attacked for your studies? Have you been attacked trying to put some of this stuff out? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. By the visible and invisible. <laughs> Which stuff do they hate the most? Which stuff do they not want you to say the most? Um, I think it's, it's the uh, internal hierarchies. Who the is, leaders um, are. Who, who they yeah, are. The, the whole thing. Yeah, who they are and how their hierarchy is set up. Functions. Get it. I get it. Yeah, yeah, I'm always trying to tell Daniel and say things on the show that's all kind of uh, – we, we can't say things. and We have to say things so people can understand them, right? You can yeah. talk about history. You can talk about subjects. But you almost have to say things so people can kind of understand them that didn't even read anything into any of this. And it's tough. So, yeah, just wondering. Yeah, so, you know, I'll give you kind of an example of how it kind of works. So I was on this one, and I knew I was on with some some Masons pretty pretty quickly. And at the end of the show, and they were doing all the usual challenges this way and that way, but and I thought it was a pretty good show because it showed both points of view. And at the end of the show, um, I was dealing with... Uh, the, the younger fellow, and uh, he said, well, what would you think if you were being, you know, if you were told you were being interviewed by a 32nd degree uh, adept? And I said, well, a couple of things. I said, one, you're either not telling the truth because if you're talking about the Scottish right, you're not an adept till your 33rd degree. Your third degree would be the equivalent, but he's using 32nd degree. So I said, the other thing is, is you are a bloodline adept you've been initiated since childhood and that you're not 
old enough yet to receive a full adept title. So you use the, the term 32nd degree adept until you're old enough to be an adept, even though you're way above uh, the adept leader of Freemasonry or Illuminati or Rosicrucian today. And he says, you know, you're, you're just bang on on that. That's exactly right. And uh, so then we closed the show off. And about a week later, I got these horrible <laughs> messages back. And they weren't going to do the show and calling me all sorts of names. I think it was fine up until... I, I exposed that 32nd degree for what it was, and they were not going to do, they refused to, 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 to release the show. I mean, just anytime you hit on that hierarchy on information that they don't want other people to know, you get, you get an instant reaction. Daniel had an instant reaction not long ago when he mentioned the C word, you know, when we talked about. And we don't actually talk about that C word on here. I apologize, everybody, but that is a a a, a word that will get our channel taken away. So, uh, moving things along, Gary, I did want to ask you because I sometimes I'm you know I've got cable like most people, and I'm browsing the channels, and I'll come across ancient aliens. I kind of like this show because it talks about things I'm interested yeah. in. But one thing that drives me crazy is when these giant CGI ships come on the screen. I'm thinking, oh man, this is making it, this is taking things in a direction that I don't really subscribe to. I feel like this is deception to, um, you know, say like Anki is a scientist that is using tools. You know, we talked about that earlier, or that these guys were using rocket ships. It seems that you share the belief that these gods were using portals i know that there's actual parts from the stories from the tab cuneiform tablets where they talk about like oh nurgle came to visit us and he stepped through a portal or we yeah. went through the portal and we looked at the uh, the underworld or the uh, the nether realm or the nether realm world order the other nwo uh, it, it, am i right about this this is more like stargate than what we're seeing on ancient aliens right yeah. these are portals not spaceships yeah. yeah i would say that they don't come from different planets they come from different dimensions so you have fairy uh, grays coming through in their ufos through fairy portals or fairy domen d-o-l-m-e-n you can google that and they're kind of like a mini stonehenge stonehenge is thought to have all of those crossover gateways that were portals the triptych uh, architecture I talked about is a representation of a portal. In the Ugarit, they regularly went back. The kings uh, and the dead regularly went back and forth between the portals, as did as did their gods. Uh, I think it's more likely that whole thing of the uh, complete hierarchy and different kinds of uh, aliens are all coming through through portals versus um, different planets. You have pyramids that were thought to be some sort of technology located on ley lines and things like that, that we just don't understand what they were. And in ancientology, you have pyramids and towers and ziggurats as being understood as the same thing. You had people like Nimrod in the Bible and in other accounts outside the Bible who also talk about him sort of add some interesting sort of context that he would say these these things to the God of the Bible that if he steps out of line again, he's going to go into heaven and, and kill the God of heaven. And one says, well, there's no way you could build a tower high enough to get wherever heaven is. Uh, it just makes no sense. But Babel isn't understood in Akkadian as it is in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's understood as confusion of languages. In Akkadian, they take that word Babel, and it's Babalu, which is the ILU is the um, transliteration for EL, for an angel or a god. And just as AL is, as we talked about earlier, and there's a few other transliterations, just IL would be the same thing as well. And so Bab means a portal or a gate. So this was a gateway of the gods. 
some sort of technology that would take you into another dimension, which would be the only way that he could go into heaven if he was going to attack God. And if you wanted to get his gods that he was worshiping out of the abyss prison, then he'd have to go into um, Hades or Sheol in another dimension. So he would have to be able to travel interdimensionally. And when it talks in the Bible that Antichrist in Daniel 8.10 is going to go into heaven and throw down some of the starry host, he's going to be like Nimrod. He's going to be like Satan who tried to storm heaven and will storm heaven again with Antichrist at the same time in Revelation 12 at the midpoint of the last seven years through these portals. And so there's a technology that's out there that's we're just now sort of coming to grips with that is has all of these portals and they're they're freaking everywhere. Uh, you know, Gilgal Raphaim, the Wheel of the Giants, is supposed to have over a hundred different domains in there. Step step in, ask you something for a second. Yep. Um, I sure appreciate you coming on Daniel's show. We've enjoyed your company on here many times. I've been listening to Daniel for years, and you've been coming on here for a long time. You are so well-researched, sir. Well, thank you. Thank you for adding a depth to Daniel's show. You know, He does the long dive, the deep dive into subjects that most shows can't cover because you need more time. And uh, just yeah. thanks for spreading this out. You are such a knowledgeable person. We don't agree on everything uh, Gary, but man, I sure appreciate you coming on Daniel's show and laying this stuff out because I like to read mythology and I like I, I I study Christianity. I'm from I'm a Mormon, you know. I'm baptized Mormon, but um, I would say I'm Mormon. I've kind of said I'm not Mormon <laughs> a while back, <laughs> but um, do Mormons, Gary, in your opinion, are Mormons? feeding into that Christian thing? Are they going to be saved by Christ? Because they believe they're the Latter-day Church of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. I, I think if their faith is strong enough, then yes. If their would faith be. is strong enough and they believe in Jesus. Yep. Okay. Yeah, that's a interesting take. I know that there's many similarities between the Mormons and the Freemasons. I, I believe that some Freemasons might be involved in the origin. And then Utah itself seems to have quite a bit of mystery and things like that surrounding it. But um, Gary, what exactly is Nibiru? Is it I'll, I'll let you answer that like we hear about this over and over again nibiru the gods are coming back or they come from nibiru what in your opinion is nibiru yeah. well nibiru in the ancient alien mythos is this like 12th planet right some that's supposed to be coming back where the uh, anunnaki are coming back uh and some people also might equate it with Revelation 6 with Wormwood, but you know you have a planet come too close, it's going to do a little bit more damage than what's uh, happening in, in, in uh, the making the waters bitter in Revelation 6, so it's more ex existential than anything. So I like to go back to the original word in, in, in Sumerian, and it means planet or in the planet. And so the ancient aliens have taken it as a mythos, have taken it as a specifically a planet. But, you know, gods like Nergal come from, you know, it's from Nibiru. It's, it's another name for their home, which is in the other world, or Hades, as we would know it coming out of, out of Greek. And I think it's, uh, it's in another dimension within the Earth uh, that it actually is. And again, it just lines up better with uh, things like the Ugaritic texts and other uh, Greek um, uh, history and mythology. And it just sort of lines up uh, with a consistent sort of nature to where Nibiru is and, and uh, its alternative translation. It just seems to fit better. So, Cool, cool. 
another thing I'm curious about is, you know, you've been mentioning uh, Ugaritic quite a bit, and I have a theory from, you know, doing this show for years and kind of looking at this stuff. It seems to me like a lot of focus is put on Egypt or Sumer or even Babylon and various other cultures, few and far between. But the the Ugaritic doesn't seem to be featured that much. Uh, the, the Canaanite culture, the Canaanite belief system, the um, Canaanite pantheon and the gods, it seems almost like it's being covered up in some kind of historical cover-up or conspiracy. Uh, yeah. Would you agree or disagree with that? I agree with that 100%. I mean, it's, it's still a polytheist record, but it substantiates a lot of things in the Bible. So you don't want to really sort of publicize that. You know, uh, Ugarit, for for example, well, let me just start with uh, Baal and Ashtaroth. They're the ones who create the Raphaim that show up in the Bible. And they're doing fertility issues, rituals to bring Baal and Ashtaroth back because they've mysteriously disappeared. I think because they created the Raphaim, they went to the abyss just like the apparent gods did before the flood. Uh, and that there's a fertility issue going on that they need to create more of the Rephaim. So in Ezekiel 32, where I talked about uh, the spirits going, the demon spirits going to the abyss of the disembodied spirits, they're called the terrible ones who did terrible things on the earth and to humankind. And just as King Hababa was commissioned to be a terrible one against humankind and uh, the Ugarit in, in the Epic of Gilgamesh and um, on, and was assigned to the Cedar Forest at Mount Hermon. And so the terrible one is translated from Hebrew as Arit. And so with the male plural as the ones, the terrible ones, that would be Eretim. But the singular is Arit for terrible. And so... King Og it was a Raphaim, and he moved to Mount Hermon from another location. The Hebrew word for Og is Og, O-W-G, and it's rooted in Ug, O-W-G, meaning round or stout, just as the Nephilim were stout. So Gilgamesh, for example, was 11 cubits tall, and as a king of Uruk, he'd be over 19 feet tall just about 19 feet tall and he was four cubits wide so he would be seven feet wide so they had this stoutness to him as the king james version bible talks about uh, these giants just says azaz not only being strong but stout and there's so many of these different words that all point to this the size just as the bed of og was a two to one ratio which is was kept on display to represent that but getting back to og because i tend to get down rabbit trails uh, where, where are we talking about too when yep. you're talking about what area of the earth are we talking about where you're when you, what you're talking about nope. right now i'm talking about uh northern canaan so northern, northern israel canaan, as we know it today. Yeah. Yeah. northern israel yeah right, so, right so between mount yeah between mount hermon and tyr um, yeah. Okay. And so, Ug, U G is the transliteration in as it would be spelt without letters, uh, just the the basic letters it would be U G, and you would have Arit, which is it would be the city of the terrible one. So it would be Kiriath Ug, the terrible one, yeah, and that's who the Ugaritic text, and he's a Rephaim, and that. You have the creation of the Raphaim. You have all of the descriptions of them as giants, all the different powers that they had, that the gods of the Baalim have disappeared. And you have Ugaritic texts that also have the exact same accounts of the Epic of Gilgamesh does with about Gilgamesh and that somehow there is an association there. So it has associations with... Uh, biblical history that a lot of people don't want to have out there because then it starts to say, well, hey, maybe what it's talking about with the Emim and the Avim and the Hivim and the 
all the horim and the zamzuzim and the zuzim and all and the makathim and the gerashim and all of these tribes might be true because all of those names and the gergs and other names that are associated with that same period they are all listed in the ugaritic text hey gary including, can you hear me including the dat yeah just one other one including the dat to right. which is the tuatha danu or the tribe of the tribe of anu i don't mean to take us off of this deep conversation but did you hear the story this week that's going going viral about the woman sitting on the airplane that went hysterical because she claimed she was sitting next to a shapeshifter. Nope. I have not and then they drag, her, they drug her off the airplane, but a witness said that he watched the whole thing go down, and as they drug that lady away, that's all on video. Have you seen this? Mm -hmm. Nope. You saw it. He no. has not nope. seen it, Todd. Okay. Have you seen it, Daniel? Yeah, definitely. And in, in, in my opinion, it would fit right into what we've been talking about, the um, uh, deception of these a demons or gods. Said, a witness uh, said the woman was talking to the guy and she wasn't saying a single word back, but she flipped out. And then after the, they pulled her off the airplane, the witness said that he looked at the guy and the guy looked at him and he winked at him. And as he winked, his eyelid didn't wink ver horizontally, it winked vertically. And he didn't even register that till he got home three hours later. Yeah, this is some uh, interesting stuff. Uh, there was also the story of the family in Las Vegas that was seeing the uh, rather tall aliens in their backyard. Uh, to me, this falls right in line with things like Project Bluebeam or... Um, you know, things we've heard about the, um, uh, well, there's a part in revelations about the, the frogs coming out of the dragon's mouth. And a lot of people think that might be a metaphor for a future, either alien invasion or a, uh, alien deception. You, you know what I'm talking about, right? Gary, the frogs out of the dragon's mouth. Yep. 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 And I was just sort of thinking that, you know, that whole changeling thing. I mean, that's, you know, part of what the angel, the the gods could do, the angels could do, right? They could, you know, Zeus could even change himself into a wolf, and that's how he created the werewolves, right? Um, and with King Lycan. So, you also have uh, elementals that are shapeshifters too. It's a, a significant trait. Some people think that one of the traits of inherited by the Nephilim and Rephaim were, was a shapeshifting capability as well. So this changeling ideology is uh, something that's there in the occult and that uh, it's a possibility. Uh, I don't know whether it still exists with the descendants or it's just with, uh, you know, the original uh, creations. Um, but certainly it's something that the elementals seemingly have a very strong accounting of having a capability of doing. And Gary, uh, we are getting close to the three-hour mark. I did want to go back to the book a little bit. What made you decide to write a follow-up to the Genesis 6 conspiracy? Yeah, because I said I would never write a sequel to it. Um, so I thought I, ha I, was, I wrote a unique book and that I was trying to sort of get people from all sections to have a, a closer look and get a better understanding of the world and to make decisions for themselves because it's important to educate yourself and make your own decisions and know why you believe what you believe. And the Christian community, um, and I'm a Christian, um, I, I was quite surprised at how starved they were on information in the Bible. And so this book is more targeted at the Christians for all the things that they're not taught because they're not taught prehistory and prophecy in, in the Bible. And there is just so much prehistory that's context for end time prophecy for uh, understanding what it says in the Bible. And, you know, all the so I go through what's in the Bible and I go deeper than anybody else has done uh, on 
all of these different uh, types of uh, giants that are in the Bible. I go through the angelic hierarchy, uh, both the uh, uh, fallen hierarchy and the loyal hierarchy. I go through the different kinds of angels. Um, I go through the giant wars and details on each of the campaign all the way through to the time of King Solomon. And then I take those important words and I translate that into the allegories and the context that they're going to need to understand end time uh, biblical prophecy. And then I start laying down that chronology for them in a way that, uh, that, that makes sense. At least I think it makes sense and something that they, they can use. So it was uh, just because of the, the contact with the audience that convinced me I should stop the current book that I was writing and do this book. So uh, I'm pretty happy with the, way, with the way it's turned out. And I think it uh, should open a lot of Christians' eyes. Yeah. I'm right. sure. Todd, Gary, um, you, we're, gonna, we're approaching the end of our interview. Gary, uh, give me one question. Todd, one pause. question. Let me, let me talk to you for a second. I was going to ask right. if you had any final questions for our guest, Gary, or any comments or anything like that. Go ahead. Gary, one question. Do you know Daniel at all, just besides he has a show? Do you know him at all? I do not. You do not. You've been on his show numerous times. His best shows were when you come on there. So really? you have a community. <laughs> well, some of them. Awesome. We, we love awesome. God's <laughs> Anunnaki stuff like that. Our, the audience yeah. here is just hugely into that stuff. That's why we like you so much, Gary. His biggest yep. shows are when you came on. Gary, so thank you for coming on here again. again. Perfect. Even if you thank don't you. know, we have, you have a big following. People that love you, and um, I'd awesome. love to hear your research. You do such deep yep. dives. We I think they call that. it. I saw it in the chat earlier. They call it the Wayne Gang. Hashtag the Wayne, Wayne Gang. gang. <laughs> 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 oh, <that's crazy. laughs> no, we love you, Gary. Please come I back have again, question, Gary. This I deep will. stuff. Yep. Uh, yep. Um, you know what? You, you you have another interesting concept called uh, I might be saying it wrong, but I know the first part is right. Parallel counts, because I know like you have like you know yeah. like a flood in the yep. Bible, then you have a flood in the ancient Sumerian text, yep. mm -hmm. and all these certain things. So, what do you mean by parallel count? Yeah. So, typically, what happens, and and I. And I Try and explain this to to Christians so that they can take a step back, but also have a, a way to push back as well. You know, for example, you, you have the Epic of Gilgamesh, and that's basically said because it's from the oldest records are like 2150 BC, but actually it dates even before. So it's an older account of the flood, and it's basically said that by a lot that the Hebrew Genesis flood story was copied from that. And what I argue is, is that, no, they're similar on the macro level. They're talking about the same event, but the details are significantly different. So this is a human survival story in the book of Genesis on an ark, but on the ark in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh is two-thirds God and one-third human, and we talked about being born from Lugobanda, the male king of Uruk, and the fertility goddess Nin, and that's the second incursion. Um, but he also, later on the Epic of Gil Gilgamesh, seeks out Apnapishtin, uh, or Zayazudra, or Itzubar, um, and no, Itzubar would be Gilgamesh, I'm sorry. But anyways, the, the one who is the Sumerian Noah, Zayazudra and up to Pishtun. And he is two-thirds God and he's one-third human. His whole family is two-thirds God and one-third human. So it's talking about the same catastrophe, but it's talking about the survival of giants. But it also has a second incursion in there in the same story. You move over yeah. to the Greek version, just to give one more example, um, and you have Deucalion and Pyrrha, and they're the Greek Noah, but Deucalion is the son of Prometheus, so he's a demigod, and it's another giant story. And then all around the world, you have human, in different colors, uh, cultures, you have uh, 
giant survival some way, somehow in the earth, off the earth, on arcs, human survival some way, climbing a mountain in the earth, off the earth. And but they're different accounts. And so they're parallel it's like accounts testimony. of the same. Yeah. It's so like Gary, a polytheist Vinicius. lens as opposed to a monotheist lens. Yeah. Gary, before you go, and I know it doesn't matter, um, do you think there's actual giants still alive today, or does that matter? Hiding underground, um, or does that matter? I think I think it's a possibility. If they had the technology They're uh, hiding. to put them in stasis in the earth or off the earth, that would be possible. That Afghanistan account uh, is quite enthralling in terms of the detail and the accuracy. So things like that suggest to me that they're either back or will be back or they somehow survived. But um, barring that, we still have the descendants, but I don't rule out that they're still here or they've come back. And Gary, I do thank you for joining us for so long. Um, I do want to go ahead and close things out, but first, let you go ahead and hop up on the soapbox or step in front of the podium and say whatever you have left to say to my audience out there, the fan base out there. And, and please, by all means, follow that up by anything you would like to plug or promote. Sure. I think the, the thing I would like to say to people is, is, is just as I was saying on the parallel accounts, we have a common hidden history and we need to figure that out. We need to make decisions uh, for ourselves, why we believe what we believe and not um, be just accepting what somebody says. Be a contrarian. Um, verify things yourselves and know why you believe what you believe wherever you end up. And uh, I've done that and it makes you comfortable in terms of what you believe. And you have to make a choice in, 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 in this world. And we're here for a short period of time and we should know why we're here. And it's up to you to figure that out. So I would encourage you to take some of the things we talk about and dig deeper and decide for yourselves wherever you end up on that. Um, I would also say that if you want to get a hold of me, the best way to get a hold of me is through my website at the Genesis six conspiracy.com. That's Genesis six, the number six conspiracy.com. And on that website, if you go to the media page and click on contact uh, Gary Wayne for an interview, that's my email address. If you want to get a hold of me, ask me a question or, or ask for, for more information, that's how you do it. The email on that is genesis6conspiracy at gmail.com with the number six as well. So that's the best way to, to, to get a hold of me. Um, I don't have any uh, live functions booked yet for the fall, but there's a few things in the iron. My new book will be out for September or uh, August or September by the looks of it. So if you want to know about all the things that I talked about and more, uh, and I get into the divine essence and things in the book, I get into the portals and things like that as well. That's uh, you're going to like the book, but it is, uh, it is all about what's in the Bible and the Ugaritic texts I cover off a lot as well. And is this going to be available via direct order from the website or should we get onto Amazon? You can do both. So currently it's uh, with my first book as will be the second will be marketed from the website and I'll have a generous excerpt of all, all 84 chapters on there when it's ready to go. It will, uh, so you can get a sign, you'll be able to get a signed copy for both off my website. You can also link over even today from my website over to amazon.com for my book as you will for the new one amazon.ca barnesandnoble.com and there's also a link for the kindle version as well and will be for the new book as well excellent todd dr robert would you like to say goodbye to gary our guest today gary, gary have a good day. Come back again gary please come back again i appreciate your wealth of knowledge i enjoyed thank you. you i will I thank you yep. thank you you have a good day, sir. Bravo. You too. Yep. All right, Gary. Thank you very much for joining us, my friend. And I can't wait to talk to you again. Hello? And Gary, yep, wherever so you are, enjoy yourself. I hear you're up in a, yes. in a fantastic area in the mountains. Um, nope. Northern, uh, nope. Northern Canada, so... 
Northern Canada, <laughs> yes. You're close, close enough to the mountains. Close enough. Down here in Utah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're down here in Utah. We got mountains close to us. Yeah. Are you near cities? Yeah. Nope. Are you near the cities? Nope. You know, two thirds of the United States is covered with smoke from Canada. We're we're not happy about that situation right now. It's it's not we, his we figured fault. To, yeah. Have you heard we, that we, situation? We need to be, <laughs> oh, oh yeah, we don't have much of that here where I am, but there's lots of it. We just thought we needed to increase our exports. Oh, there you go. Just ship it all down here. Yeah, all your smoke. <laughs> you got to do bad it down smoke. here. I love it. Ship it down here. <laughs> ah. Damn Canadians. <laughs> no, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, we appreciate you. Gary, thanks for coming on here, man. You are a wealth of knowledge. I went and listened to a few shows before you came on Daniels. I, I can't remember the name of the host, but um, but I appreciate those guys that host you. You are a wealth. You, you dive deep into these subjects. I look into these subjects, but you're deep on these. Definitely. I, and I love what you say about taking these, taking what you say and going off and doing your own research because, man, that can be a very fulfilling experience. That's something that I've gotten into myself. And the, the, well, the, the well never ends. Like, it just keeps going and going. The rabbit hole never ends, is, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. So, Gary, thank you very much. And um, we will talk to you again someday. Okay, good. Good night. Yeah, take care, my friend. Tune back into end of day's radio. Peace. All righty. Um, thought it was wow. time to finally let him go because wow. that was three hours. Wow. My God. You yeah, can't, nice, Gary nice Wayne hours. only does great. two hours. Gary Wayne only does one or two hours anywhere he goes. So you get three hours, Daniel. Fuck, that's incredible. That was a good show. I learned that a was a great show. show. And and Dr. Robert, thank you for calling in and questioning Gary Gary on some of those subjects, the female, the female aspect of divinity. Yeah, great Talk question about for that sure. Shit, man. Whoa, you've blown that topic fucking wide open. Right on. Now, you got some just, heavy just hitters here. Like, you know, if you know anything about mythology, like the goddesses had human sons and daughters too. So yeah. So what? So where's that picture at? You know. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a. It's well, Gary's a, coming from a uh, Gary's coming from a harder, a harder core. You don't get where Gary's coming from. Neither do I, because man, he that's how good he is. Gary ain't coming out here being a born again Christian, saying everybody's a bad person. I've done some research. He's diving deep into <laughs> mythology and bad person. Yeah. No, he's, no, diving he's, deep in, <laughs> he's very open. He's diving he's very deep. Very clear where he stands. He's very clear where he stands. And well, he's diving deep. He's, and he's diving humble deep. too. He's he 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 he's, he's humble. You know, he, he's willing to say, you know, it's my belief. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But hey, guys, we're gonna go to a little break. Take like a ten minute break, and then we'll. You're welcome to stay, keep stay on panel. We're gonna do a little break, and then we're gonna come back and um, do news roll and uh, sports and uh, uh, mind blowing moment of the day. Yeah, I just sit we back and just watch and pay attention, man. Let's do it. I'm here. I'm yeah, not doing nothing. We gotta get the, um, I'm going to smoke the some weed news. real quick. So I'll be yeah, you, you go smoke some weed. I'll drink some beers. Daniel, we got to get the news of the, the, the news, you know? We yeah. We got to get the news. Yeah. In. Go grab whatever you got. Hey, you order to us All right, here we go. <laughs> you guys, okay, what's that? go grab whatever topic you'd like to talk about Danny. when we come back. Uh, what, what was that, Robert? Before we go Did to you break? get that article I sent you today about uh, Schumer? Uh, it's about what? It's about Schumer um, trying to like pass a bill to force, you know, NASA to reveal all the UFO data and stuff like that. Um, uh, I texted to you. I, I, I emailed it to you. I mean, I um, uh, gotcha. I added you today on uh, okay. on threads. I'll pull that out uh, when we come back. So let's go ahead and go to the break. Let's play some tunes, and we will be back very, very soon, everyone. I thank you for sticking with us for three plus hours, but there's plenty more to come. I just need to go freshen up a little bit. Thank you. As soon as I can get my music working again, I apologize. Sometimes it crashes, but it only takes a second to fix.
I think we're doing pretty good today. Not too many technical difficulties. Consciousness and Awakening Mankind. This is End of Days Radio. We are live! I just can't find it. I'm not recording right now, are right? Yeah. Well, I'm just going to play that same round. We are live! <laughs> <laughs> Fuck was that? Weird. Here I am, Esther! I never had a gun I'm still standing here now Am I the only one? I can hear your footsteps They always surround me Give me one good reason that I should believe. Damn. Oh, see, yeah, 
Miles Davis was James and Bob James 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 Radio the Show The Star Yeah Let's check it out Let's see how it sounds And welcome back to End of Days Radio. I am your host, Daniel, broadcasting to you from the beautiful Broken Ruins here in the heart of the Pacific Northwest, the land of sin and iniquity, the yeah. land post apocalypto of the homeless warriors in their tactical vests and the mop handles that they carry around. While wearing Everlast headgear, prepared to face the danger. Fighting the demons. Fighting the demons, swinging at the invisible demons with their, <laughs> with their mop hand. <laughs> Pulling back the flood, putting your finger in the hole of whatever's coming at us. Whatever. Yes. I'm going to take one more hit, man. I'll be right back. All right. One more hit. Yeah, get it in, Dr. Robert. Send me we want that. your brain to be super sharp. My brain's super sharp as much as it's molded mul mul or melted. Most people that listen the to this do it when they're love, drunk or stoned or or tripping on shrooms or maybe. And is that water. bad? Is that bad? Am I bad? I'm not, I drink I'm not complaining. Budweisers. No, I, I'm, not I'm not complaining. Bad. I give up on all that. I tried to have My an intervention with Todd, and keeps then it just telling me to shut the hell up. Oh, but um, uh, you know, when I'm yelling, only when I'm yelling does she say "shut up." But other than that, it's all good. Well, we do have plenty to talk about, including our mind-blowing moment of the day. Wow. There's quite a few wow. of them, but let's go ahead and get into that. Oh yeah, mind-blowing. Hold, hold, hold on a minute. Mind blowing moment of the day. day. Blowing our minds, blowing, blowing our minds, away. blowing our balls, Mind blowing, blowing our minds. Of the day. Oh. Blow our minds, blow our minds, oh. eating the extra spicy oh. Cheetos, oh. having oh. a burning mouth. <laughs> All right, it'll, it'll put a hole in your. Our hole. minds have been blown. <laughs> As your spicy Cheetos. <laughs> I tried to blow on this and it wasn't in my mouth. Okay, so I'm going to say my, the mind blowing moment of the day was the when uh, Gary said that the Scythians or Scythians were giants. I did not know that. Scythians. 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 I just thought they were a bunch of weirdos. I had no idea. But you didn't know they were riding mind. giant horses? I was going to ask, no. were there giant horse bones somewhere? Did someone discover giant horse bones? I wanted to ask that. but that's Well, they, they have those ones like on the um, Budweiser commercials, the Clydesdales. Well, they have Clydesdales are big horses, but I'm talking and, about. And Nephilim could times. ride one of those. Did they have three times that size? I'm not sure. Did you guys or, have one? Robert, do you have one? Did you, did you have a yeah. mind-blowing moment of the day? I wouldn't say it was a mind blowing moment of the day, but but like I was interested when you're talking about like like their hair, like their physical features and stuff like that. Because um this little series I'm doing with the general, the general Lee on subconscious realms, basically, the second part, where we're going into the Moors, but we're talking about the Adena culture. The black hairs. Yeah, 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 the yeah. Black yeah, 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 yeah. The Adena culture, man, they, they were giants. They're a race of giants. You know, like the average. Like the average female skeleton remains were like nine feet tall. Whoa. The only reason I mentioned that is because have you ever heard of the black Irish? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And not only that though, too, like the Egyptians, like many of the eight, because I read an article the other day and I sent it to the um to the general when we when we come to that part basically, but like a lot of the Egyptians had naturally blonde hair. Nine foot tall no, woman, not one I would talk back to. Yeah, 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 definitely, yeah, yeah. No, Not yeah. only that, but notice how um, people from, like, um, um, South America don't grow facial hair. 
but their hair is solid black, but they don't grow no facial hair or body hair. Yeah, we're all kind of, that's a trip. We are, we are all kind of like subtly different. It's like, not as much subtly different as noise. if as if there were different uh, um, Gary Wayne's talking about different hierarchies. I don't like hierarchies myself, me neither, right? Me neither. Me neither. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a member of any secret society, so I haven't taken any oath. You know how Gary Wayne's saying, if you take an oath at the end, then you're not going to get out of the red. You're not going to get when God comes back. Oh, the people that took the oath on the other side. I'm, I'm not a fan of hierarchies into, either. I mean, that's kind of the appeal of, of <laughs> Luciferianism. You just yeah. like, you obey nobody and you don't believe in any hierarchies or authorities. I you know, my spirit guys told me too, man, because like, you know, because my yeah. spirit guys told me because I would that possibility. Your, it's always that one possibility. Your spirit guides over. Huh? Almost, I would trust your spirit guides almost over. Anybody I just met that told me they knew something coming from beyond. No, well, my spirit guys were just, they, 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 they were basically making clear to me, like, you know, because, like, there's always these choices we have to make. We're just all, yeah. like, kind of like, like one choice away or one bad day from going over to the dark side. But no they were, doubt. Like, basically, yeah, they were, like, basically telling me, you know, that, like, if I was ever, like, to do anything contrastly, like, like with, like, a secret society or, like, the Illuminati or something like that, then they yeah. can kill me. Like once you contract with them, then they have yeah. the power to kill you. You lose your spiritual right. protection. That exactly. is true. Very true. In the military too. Because if you're in the military and you, and you sign oaths, they they can they can legally and spiritually kill you if you sign an oath and said I would not talk about anything that I hear here. If you go out there, not only can the military kill you, but the like spiritual elements can kill you too. That's one of the reasons this show is has some few characters on it that that's why i'm still alive because i never agreed to any of that shit yeah we didn't sign a pact we didn't give our blood to him well i did but i I renounced it you you gotta gotta think about it though i mean mean, because like everything we do think or say creates karma so like if you enter into like a gentlemanly agreement with a group or an organization or another individual dude that's one thing and, 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 and you break that oath I mean, like, it, it will produce bad karma. I don't see why it wouldn't. No, but you, when you join them, you they own you. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean by that. I mean, yeah, definitely. But I'm saying, though, that 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 that's the karma. Like, if you do it, it's still, though, like, there's still rules and laws. That's why, mm-hmm. I mean, they own you. And then if you break the oath, you know what I mean? Like, there's other consequences that you can, that, that you can incur. See, see, you can break the oath. Like, what's going on in the United States right now? is a bunch of whistleblowers supposedly are coming out saying, we've seen some shit about UFOs Uh that is making us uncomfortable. We took some oaths to the United States, but something else is going on here. Something else is going on here. No, I hear you. I'm I'm, I'm not saying you. I'm I'm just saying either I still think you get bad karma Because you're supposed to be truthful in everything you do with anyone. Like, I'm supposed to be, like, honorable and respectful like, and keep like, my word in any type of relationship I enter into, no matter who that person is or who that being is. So that's why that's why you say you just don't make the oath. Like, that's why like, you don't know what you're getting into. Dr. Robert, with it. Dr. Robert, Dr. Robert, like, right here on this show. This show is a place where people are being drugged and to the council of heaven tell the truth or not let's go and uh end of days has always been a test of you know the end of time of your soul that, that's what i love about this show is it's testing people's souls who's the real people that believe in this stuff and what's the reality behind the scenes and this show goes about as deep as it can get go on dr robert I'm saying I pretty much agree with you. I'm just saying, though, I mean, like, in my perspective, like, you from know, your my perspective, journey, in my journey, like, mm-hmm. I mean, like, no matter what other people are doing, you're yeah. supposed to be on top of your fucking square. Like, you know the rules, 
you know right from wrong. Fuck with anybody else is doing so like if I because you know like I have an agreement with a gin like me and the, me and the gin have a pretty good, good, good you have an agreement with a gin like yeah. the, the gin yeah 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 we have a, a contract wow. but the contract wow. he liked me you know he liked my style and he was searching for the gin no aren't gin more like Middle Eastern spirit yeah 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 but let me tell you, yeah let me tell you the story though I mean we made a pack but the pack it, it, it's a good pack though it's like look like I help you and in helping you. You helped me get some good karma. That's really what it is, basically. Like he there wants to go. do good. He wants to do good through me, and then he helps me because I was a little naive. We just gotta have a little pack, though. But I'm saying though, it, 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 it's a noble pack. There you go. You know what I mean? They're not all bad, but I'm saying though, totally. Maybe, maybe he's trying to redeem himself. It's exactly what he's trying to do. But in my perspective, though, it's like whoever I make a deal with, I have to be fair in entering any yeah. deal being fair. Good yeah, we should deal with it in a contract, Period. in a contract, in yeah. a contract. Period. That's why you set yourself up for that. That's why you got, I mean, see, in the law, like, you got to know what you're getting into. You got to understand the contract, what it means, what it implies, how it can it Kind of like, contract. kind of like coming on Daniel's show is a contract. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, like, like the, the only not contract like is that you come in here Knowing that we're all wide open, we're we're accepting of everything, but we ask for the truth doesn't mean you have to give it. It just means we're all searching for the truth. One of the most powerful things about Daniel's show is he allows everyone to come on here and give every view, yeah, that's true. give every point of view, and come that's on true. on. But the contract. I even had a communist the on the show before, and then Tifa got communists. We got Illuminatis. We got Masons. We got. Everyone is yeah, here. I just, believe, but, uh, I, I just believe you keep your word with whoever you make it with. Just keep your word. Let's I did not get that, that article word. that you sent me over Threads. I'm I'm kind of new to Threads, so I don't know if you like sent it to me Let's the message who's or what. Keep their word here in the end. Yeah, yeah, man, I might gonna... be able to text it to you in the chat. Hold on. Well, why don't you just go ahead and just bring it up and tell us here? Let's and see who's going to have the most the powerful argument by the end of this. Everyone, because. It ain't about domination as much it is as it is about getting to the truth. Well, Todd, Don't let's we let's roll out the, the news. Is. This is a good conversation, but let's, let's, let's roll out the, the news. news. All right, so give me the news. First, first news article of the day. Did you see the video of Joe Biden farting? No, but it sounds like something he does like all day long. I cannot stand the man. That is just me. I'm He's sickened gassy. by the image of our president. And he eats too much pizza. It's really sad. And not that Trump's better looking. It's just that he's the Whoa, image Trump's of better looking? corruption. No, I, didn't I, know we were, I didn't know we were judging Trump, their looks. Well, Trump is 10 times better looking. My wife is <laughs> saying, please stop yelling. Sorry, honey. Joe Biden. Scream it at the top like of your lungs. Me. Trump is great looking. Trump, I love <laughs> Trump. No, I'm not saying that. He's a bell bottle. Joe Biden looks like a goddamn walking corpse. He can't even speak straight most of the time. Or he talks um, to somebody that's not even there. That's the leader of the most hey, check the, check the chat, the Dan. Earth, a walking check the, corpse check the chat. with no memories. All right. I'm okay, going to go chat. on. I'm checking... It, did you say it's on thread? He's falling down the stairs. Yeah, to go to the trap, though, I just gave it to you. It's, it's, it's a New York Times article. On threads? No, no. It's, it's, I put it in the chat. So all you got to do is hit the link. Oh, so go to, go, go, go oh, to sure. our chat. All right. I'm open. Yeah. All right. Before I posted, I posted something in the chat. Hold on. I got to mute Todd. I He's love. Clanking his dishes around. Okay, so this is from the New York Times. Bipartisan measure aims to force release of UFO records. Legislation backed by Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, would create a review board to declassify documents related to unidentified aerial phenomena across the government. Senator Chuck Schumer of New York, the Majority Leader, is pushing legislation to create a commission with broad authority to declassify government documents about UFOs and extraterrestrial matters in an attempt to force the government to share all that it knows about unidentified phenomena measure offers the possibility of pushing back against the conspiracy theories that surround discussions of UFOs and fears that the government is hiding critical information from the public. The legislation, which Mr. Schumer will introduce as an amendment to the annual defense policy bill, has bipartisan support, including that of Senator Mike Rounds, Republican of 
Republican of South Dakota and Senator Mark Rubio, Republican of Florida, who has championed legislation that has forced the government to release a series of reports on unidentified phenomena. Support in the House is also likely. On Wednesday, the chamber included a narrower measure in this version of the annual defense bill that would push the Pentagon to release documents about unidentified aerial phenomena. Hmm. They have a 300-day deadline to release this information. The weather goes on. Check it out on New York Times if you would like to read the rest of the article. Interesting stuff. I have to wonder if this is legit or if this is more alien invasion, oh. deception, programming. Yeah, Hocus Pocus. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Yeah, not too. Oh, I got to unmute Todd. He's trying who to sent, Who sent him that article? Dr. Robert. Dr. Robert. Hey, Dr. Robert, I've been following that subject so close. I'm watching these fucking alien revelations like a hawk. Because yeah. I'm, the, I'm the old school Bill Cooper fan. <laughs> Bill Cooper back in the 90s. Yeah. I'm subsuspicious of these alien re revelations. I kind of think it's Nazis too, man. I think I brought it up before. That's why I think Chuck Schumer might be interested. Oh, let's go into Nazis, yeah. I think it's yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck I, I, Schumer I, looks like a goddamn Nazi. No, but I'm saying though he's Jewish though. And then if you know he's like Jewish and all that, that's the part people can't get is <laughs> that's the that's the weird part people don't get about the Jewish Nazis. Yeah, yeah. No, the, no I'm not calling them Nazis. Nazis. I'm saying, the, the, I'm saying the the like, Jewish Nazis. You think like the Nazis were the mortal enemies of the Jews, right? So being Jewish. And then, like, but the like, whole goddamn then, story, Doctor Robert, was created because World War II was such a horrible event, kind of like 9/11, that the people of the time just bought the whole goddamn thing, lock, stock, and barrel, because they wanted it to be over. The horror. My grandfather went to Japan. He fought fucking J Japanese people. Went to the islands. Horrible stories of killing people. Imagine. They the twisted sport. their fucking minds. They're still <laughs> twisting people's minds with war right now over in Ukraine and Russia. But we're not talking about that part because we're in America. We're all comfortable. We're just sending guns, bombs, and cluster munitions with radioactivity on them. We're sitting here comfortable. My grandfather went to Japanese islands and rooted out people scared to death. Yeah, but that's why I, I think I think this show and then like talking about like the possibility of like a Nazi rules has like made people like Schumer and then want to look into it and see what the fuck is really going on here. You know what I let mean? Let me tell you. Let me let me lead in real quick with something big. Raiders of the Lost Ark just come out with a new movie, right? Oh yeah, I mean, I have Indiana Jones. The new movie. I What's have... the name of the movie? I, uh, Indiana Jones and the. Something hunt for something. Yeah, yeah, I have, fucking... it, though. I have it on my queue, man. I mean, I'm gonna watch it soon. But I'm gonna fucking. I haven't seen it either, but I saw the last one, and you know what the last one was about? The what? crystal skulls oh, of yeah, the aliens. Yeah, yeah. The aliens. I love that's the one where like the man. nuke goes yeah, off and he jumps inside a refrigerator and lives. The nuke goes <laughs> off. It's so bad. He's running from the nuclear blast. He jumps into a lead-filled refrigerator. Giving you a survival tip in case a nuclear bomb goes off, get inside a lead lined refrigerator. Would that help, right? Us? <laughs> well, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna go get some if old refrigerators. You believe in nuclear bombs, get one for every member of the family. Yeah, Daniel, go get some refrigerators. We'll come up and meet you in Seattle <laughs> when the bomb you. goes off. <laughs> exactly. I've had dreams of. <laughs> Seattle just getting wiped out in a nuclear attack. Just getting like wiped out. We're going to have to get you down here, Daniel. We got to get you out of Seattle. Those dreams are gnarly, man. I've had those dreams before. Like a oh, yeah, those dream. end of the world ones. Oh, man. We're in the middle of you. We're in the middle of the United States where most people are going to conglomerate toward Utah and, and up towards northern, you know, in the center. When they attack the world, when the bombs go off, they're going to go off on the coast. And they're going to yeah, go off cities. in the major cities. Oh, so Seattle is not a good place to be. California is supposed to break off. <laughs> <laughs> you think? 
<laughs> and then Japan's supposed to stay. <laughs> You can't hit, Danny. So you gotta get out of there, brother. It depends on where I'd you're love at. To. It depends on where you're at in Utah. You don't want to be near Hill Air Force Base or Dugway Proving Ground or any of those biological weapon centers that they have. The only oh, reason I'm know. still in Seattle is because of the legal pot. That's the only reason. The legal I pot. That's Seattle too, man. Seattle's beautiful, man. <laughs> I took a lot. It I had is. a sister live in Queen Anne. Like Seattle, you could probably gone, smoke. Though. You Queen can probably beautiful. Fun Salt Lake. The but... food scene in Seattle too, man, is like it's best kept secret. The food yes. in Seattle is bomb. Yes, Chinese food, Indian food, Thai food, food, Mexican food. I told you about the Puerto Rican restaurant, right? Called La Isla. Yeah, yeah, I got to check that out still. Oh man, Puerto I Rican. Have this dish called Pasta de Leon, right? Mm. And it's their version of lasagna, but instead of noodles, it's plantains. So it's sweet Ooh. and savory. Oh my mm. God. Sounds good. Oh, Sounds you good. guys know that teriyaki was invented here in Seattle? What? Teriyaki? Teriyaki. Yeah. No way. That's why there's so many teriyaki places around here. It's kind of it's because there's such a big Asian I know community there's a here lot back of, in the day. I know there's a big Asian community up in Seattle. Yeah, big Chinatown and all that. All the I major wonder why that is there. because you're on the West Coast. Yeah, they all the the best West coast. Coast. <laughs> 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 Kind of, you know, Japan's over in the West. You're on yeah. the West Coast. Could happen. Yeah, I went to, um, you know, like you do the tour to go underground Seattle. No yeah. way. Oh, uh, yeah, because it's like, you know, Seattle was founded by criminals too, man. That's the story they tell you. Like Seattle oh, yeah. was founded by crooks. Totally. I didn't even know that. What do you mean crooks? Like criminals. Like straight like mobs or well, criminals. Like, you mm. know, like, like killers. That were just willing to take risks. Yeah, killers yeah. and thieves. Take like strong men. Over. Like, like fucking like strong mobsters. Man. Just like I'm Las not going to read, that. read about that. Like Las Vegas. That's the first thing they teach you, man. Seattle was like founded by criminals, dude. They had a strong criminal element. Like a yeah. strong organized criminal element, dude. Except now, in Las Vegas, they're trying very hard to get away from that image. They're trying to turn into, like, this gentrified suburban place. Oh, yeah. they're, they're trying to move the Pretend. Oakland Athletics Pretend. there. They already got the Raiders Pretend there. that everything's yeah, yeah, all yeah, good, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. But Seattle, man, I don't know, man. Seattle's nice. I mean, that's, like, one of the places I would like to live. If I had to live anywhere. Dr. Like, Robert, where, like Dr. Robert, where do you live? I live in California. California, what part? I live in like uh, I live in Laverne, California, which is in like L.A. County. Yeah, and it's right by like near Sandy. You ever heard of Raging Waters? Kind of nice, kind of like nice. Raging Very Waters. Nice. Yeah. We're real close to Anaheim, which is close to Disneyland. You know, yeah. it's about like it's still considered. How's LA. your neighborhood? Like How's your neighborhood? Do you see homeless zombies coming down? <laughs> when I work, when I work for the city attorney's office, I used to work for the city attorney's office. You used to work for division. The and so I used you to went walk downtown. Like a sea of 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 fucking homeless people all Locked day long. A sea of homeless zombies. Yeah. Yeah, especially like Skid Row. That's kind of uh, dangerous over there. You, you, it's a trip. Yeah. 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 Next yeah. news story. I got family that's moved out of there just Next because they got so bad. Oh, news stories. We need news stories. Come on, Daniel. Give us the latest news story. The movie Sound of Freedom. It's there you go. Unexpectedly, very well. I believe it was number one at the box office. Nobody thought that it would do so well. Now, what is Nobody... that about exactly? It's about this soldier that decides to go and um, do uh, go fight against child trafficking, and he goes and like rescues these kids. He's a real guy. He's a it's, real guy. This is yeah. Fiction. It's based on a true story. It's kind of based on the whole Q Anon thing about the That's yeah. what they're saying. That's what they're saying. Go on. Well, a, a lot of people are saying that this is actually a form of controlled opposition. Like it's a psychological right. operation. Carlos, because... Slim, Carlos Slim, the biggest fucking in Mexico, one of the biggest um, Donald, people with money put the money behind the film. Carlos Slim. The, the cell phones, all the phone. In, in Mexico, Carlos Slim put the money behind the movie. That's what I heard. It doesn't mean anything. What, he's some big billionaire or something? He's a billionaire. He's the wealthiest man in Mexico. Carlos well, Slim You know, is man, the there's a lot of that going on. I want you to get he put the money that. behind the movie. It's kind of like they're 
they're putting out something to get everybody like, hey, everybody, we're working on this thing about child slavery, you know, kind of to give people hopium, Daniel, kind of like to make you think we're putting a spotlight on it when they could have done a movie about Jeffrey Epstein or all the bullshit that's going on every single day everywhere. So you're saying they it's a distraction. Focus a distraction. Yeah, I want to get more into that. Like, what were you saying, Daniel, earlier? Bitch. Oh, I was just saying that this movie, I've heard that there's some ties to some wealthy businessmen. And um, somebody even said, like, ultimately, it, it's funded by CIA. Rockefeller and Rothschild. CIA. Oh, those are so suspect good. names. That's why it's so good. So what do you think the point is? Well, what Todd is... make a good point. Like, it might just be to keep the To make the you think they're working of... on it. To make you think they're to... working on it. Yeah, so you because... you don't have to get involved. They don't could worry be co- about it. They could be or, covering, like, Epstein or, or something like that, but they don't really seem to be... They don't seem to be naming any names, really. It seems to be like... Like, what dis- disinformation does is they'll give you 99%, and then that 1% yeah. will be the swerve or will be the exactly. lie. Exactly. So they think you don't have to think no more about it. They gave you everything. Yay! Guys are working on it. Or they want you to think about the wrong shit going the wrong direction. Yeah, they're distracting you. Hey, can you guys hold it down for, like, up to 10 minutes while I go use the bathroom? Yeah, sure. Oh, hell yeah. Okay. Yeah. Are you talking to each other? Yeah. Thank you. I'll be right back. <laughs> What's going on, Dr. Robert? How are you, buddy? I'm okay, man. I'm, like I said, I'm just chilling, man. I'm having a good time. Man, I'm glad you're back on the show. I'm glad you're staying involved in Daniel's show. Please I love it, man. Responding. I love it, man. You were giving Dr. Wayne some serious questions. You were asking about the feminine side of all this bullshit they're talking about. Uh, 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 uh. And I don't say bullshit lightly. I just mean they're kind of focused on all ma- ma- masculine men men are masculine shit, yeah. which is what the world's built on. But what you want to forget about females that had yeah, heroic exactly, yeah. roles? Yeah. You want it's to hide the, bro, but the don't female mean part of the shit? A woman or a girl. And that don't mean that we're fucking drinking Bud Light. That means we're trying to tell people there's something these guys are hiding. These guys are master manipulators. Yeah. Don't fall for what they're doing right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah don't yeah, fall yeah. for what they're doing. Glad yeah. you're glad you're a part of Daniel's yeah, team, yeah. Doctor Robert. I consider yeah. you, Doctor Robert, a part of Daniel's team. Questioning guest, questioning you know him and everybody that's on here, bringing yeah. a new perspective. When I you always had a problem, you know, man. I'll be honest with you, man. That's always been one of my biggest problems with Christianity, is like the lack of like a, like a goddess. That's always bothered me. You, you know, know my to, problem is, is that people. they got so many goddamn books. Which one is it that you're reading from? Yeah. And they're but always not, like, yeah, but not oh, the that, King like, James. I'm, hold on, hold on, Dr. Robert. They're always like, the King James, the King James. Okay, you're reading from the King James. Fine. Then you left out 10,000 other texts before the King James ever come around. And that's the one that you're going to focus on now. And that's the all truth. And I'm just like, okay, so that's what you're doing? Right on. Let's talk about it. It's pretty selective, huh? It's pretty selective. uh, it's pretty selective. Uh, yeah. Ten thousand years of shit, and that's the one. That's the one. Sixteen forty-eight. Sixteen forty-eight. When the world's pretty, pretty fucked selective. up. Yeah, that's so what about the number about, about the King James. My wife's yeah. like, "Would you please keep it down?" You keep <laughs> telling me about the King James. You know, you, 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 when I brought up the question about uh, about like, I mean, the imagery, right? Like the story itself can be an image. That can be leading us astray. I love talking about um, the images and the stories, but the yeah, leading yeah, yeah, us astray. Image too. Yeah, leading that's us what I'm astray. Saying, like, you know. Let's go, yeah. Dr. Robert. Leading us astray. Leading us astray from what? Uh, from the truth and from love and from the world getting better. That's what yeah. they're leading us astray from. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. you want to know what would you think about it? You, 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 you know, you're astray you from your it? own salvation. All that shit does is cause confusion. Yeah. That's all it does. All it does is cause confusion. We got too many isms and shit going on, man. Like, remember we talked about, like, the parallel tales? You know, like, you know, like, you know, like, you know, because you, you, we're, we're in a big world, right? So we flooded the world, right? Like, if Noah's in, and I don't know where Noah's in, but I'm saying if Noah's in, in Egypt, right, there's going to be another motherfucker in Japan 
Like you got to save all these different people. So, I mean, maybe God, you know, said, you know, I'm going to get in order to get the Middle Eastern people in, in, in check. I'm going to go talk to so-and-so over here to get the Japanese people in check. I mean, so it's just like, it's just like, wait, same thing with different eyewitness testimony. Like we're arguing over the way we process these same events, but we're just looking at these same events. From like yeah, arguing events. over the way we processed something said events. Someone said events. Yep, a exactly, lot of yep. people said. A lot of people said there was a flood. Yep. A lot of cultures said there was a flood. They said it in different ways. That's that's a marker of something that happened. Everybody said it slightly different. That's something you can record when you There's go down archaeological the line. evidence as well. Yes, that's what I'm saying. Like we get caught up in these like these minute little. But when you go down the line into the minutia about the sin yeah. and the who, oh, you did this wrong. Yeah, that, that's where the confusion oh, comes. Like that's where the confusion comes. Yeah, that's where the confusion. There was a big comes. flood. Fantastic. Everybody agrees to that. But yeah. everything else on down the line, that's yeah. where it gets confusing. Kind of crazy, yeah. And you got to think too, man. I mean, these people aren't really writing shit down. They're just telling stories. So it's and, just like, and you know, like, you God, know, like, you Robert, know, like, before we go one more minute further, we got to, you know, you got to admit to me that we all got to get along if we're going to talk on this goddamn radio show and get to the bottom of some deep subjects. We all have to agree on this radio show that we're going get, to get along and agree to let everybody say, Todd, what the do fuck you have you to use to the Lord's name in vain? <laughs> which which lord? <laughs> did I, which lord did I say? <laughs> in vain, which lord's name did I use in vain? <laughs> Shout out to because I... I'm a magician. I kind of believe in all gods and none at all at the same time. I mean, well, if, you, if you go off physics, man, it's really just one fucking singularity. Anything, it's really just the same thing. And we're just looking at this same thing from different angles. And then we're respecting like our small little angle as the whole picture. And that's what causes all this confusion, creates all these wars and shit. If we just humble ourselves and just realize we're looking at one little angle of the same thing and that we can get like another angle from a different Dr. Person. Robert, I appreciate that you have jumped on this show. I'm going to put myself at a disadvantage and say that uh, I, 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 am, I am agnostic to a certain degree. I have not decided on a god that it is. Yeah, you shouldn't, because we don't I know am, what, it. what I, I think it is. I think that the, truth. the gods are demons and we are the real gods. We are, or we are god collectively and then the gods are like archons or they're like sort of like artificial intelligence they're not like real but we are if that makes sense that's why they got to feed off us no, no, so I, until I, the no, god no, comes no, down and strikes me with a lightning bolt you guys ever seen iris in spring in line. you ever seen, seen what? in spring iris is in spring islands in the stream you ever seen that islands mm. in the stream it's an old Hemingway, Hemingway novel. I read the book too, though. Hmm. Oh, there's a there's a song by there's a song by Dolly Parton and uh, Waylings and Jennings or uh, Dolly Dolly Parton. Islands in the stream. We are what we are. Do you remember? Is that based on? But you're saying Hemingway did a did a book called Islands, Islands in, in the, the Stream. stream yeah. It's like it's yeah. Probably, what like, do you it's say? Almost autobiography, but like. It's about an artist like Hemingway living in the Caribbean mm. islands. He's divorced. Mm. He has a Sounds son nice. during the wartime. So, like, they yeah. kind of like, so he's learned about life. So, they kind of like help, like, you know, the war effort basically. And he kind of gets killed. But as he's dying and he's thinking about his kids, basically, he makes this one comment. It always runs true with me. To go back to what Daniel saying again, he says, There's not one thing in this world that is not true. It is wow. all true. Mm -hmm. I don't think. I don't think we're in any position to knock anyone's belief on anybody sees the world. I think that Did you ever see old the old movie? Movies. Did you ever see the movie Old Man of the Sea? With yeah. um, where he's going into the ocean trying to catch that giant fish. Yeah. Ernest Hemingway. You know, Ernest Hemingway was attacked by the government. I believe they it. Fucking did a psychological kind of, operation on him. They were all kind of involved in like 
you know, him and Norman. One of the Mayer, greatest writers of all time. Him and Norman they did Mayer, this boxing matches. On him. They were all they admitted in the it. They admitted it. Yeah, all of them. I want to, before this is all done, I want to talk about what they're admitting right now. I want to say something. How, how many beers are you in, Todd? I am in about five beers. Five Not beers. bad. Five five queer Budweiser's. <laughs> don't call that. <sighs> Having a good time. And I don't mean and I don't mean Budweiser's are queer, I'm saying. I'm not gonna <laughs> stop drinking Budweiser. Uh, I'm not gonna okay? stop drinking Bud because you don't like uh, Bud Light. Uh, uh, no, you're not gonna it's it's Budweiser's the I'm problem. Not Bud Light the is bud. the problem. I'm not itching my bud because you don't like Bud Light. <laughs> Once you're used I'm, to a taste of a certain beer, you got to stick with it. You can't just like switch back and forth. Like if you're an MGD guy, I've been yeah, MGD. for seven it's not years. It's not what do you want me to go to the liquor store and buy some cheap ass or uh, some phony uh, micro brew and pretend that <laughs> phony micro brew? Yeah, <laughs> pretend that it tastes it's great. Un American beers. This ain't even American. These guys, Budweiser was bought out. By what Dutch. Like, why are they be dealing Budweiser with was bought out by Dutch company long ago. That's how sick oh. our country is. What's that, Robert? Doctor Robert? Todd, you were saying why? You asked like, why are they revealing this shit now? That's that's a pretty interesting question. Yeah, why are they doing this now? Look at what they're doing. Who's out, who's Listen, out you, Daniel. Because they want people that are in the know to join them. They leave all these little trails behind. Because if you follow them enough, eventually they're going to come to you and they're going to try to get you to join the Masons or the Rosicrucians yeah. or one know, of those groups. To get on, they're kind of leaving breadcrumbs. Come over here. We're not you will give be approached. You obvious, we're not going to give you obvious things like um, your last guest. What was your last guest name? Gary. Are you talking about the Freemason that came on? Yeah. What was his name? His name was. Why do you, you gotta ask me it? that? Why do you have to ask God, me that and make me look bad? You know Robert, you know me, but you don't it, remember. His name was Michael, time. the Message Man. Michael, come Michael. on, man! I put Sounds his last Joe name Biden up at first, there. but he did not want me to share his last <laughs> name, so we're just calling him Michael, the Message Man. Where's Michael? Where's he at this weekend? I don't know. We got to get him on here some more, though. Michael, where are you? We're all here on End of Days Radio waiting for you to sit and argue with us. Where's General Lee? I'm glad to see Dr. Roberts here. Oh, speaking of General Dr. Lee, Robert. speaking of General Lee, he will be coming to America soon. So we are excited about that. And we we might uh, oh, I'm, try to get I'm together yelling. with him. I'm yelling. All right. I'm yelling. My wife has said you are yelling. So. I'm done yelling. Have I been yelling, gentlemen? No, you're fine. I'm Next sorry. news story. I'm sorry. Next news story. My Continue wife's going to disconnect the internet if I keep yelling. Okay. Enough chaos for 10 minutes. So, Todd, are you familiar yes. with the podcast Tiger Belly? Tiger Belly? Yeah. Do you know who Bobby no. Lee is? Nope. From Mad TV, he's like a he's an Asian stand up comic. No, nope. is he the funny guy on uh, Hangover? Or... <laughs> no, that's uh, uh Kim, Kim <laughs> that Asian guy. <laughs> and well, a lot of controversy surrounding this podcast lately because apparently. Really, what's the name of the podcast? It's called Tiger Belly. It's a podcast. Tiger Belly. I've got to write this down now. <laughs> a comedian Bobby Lee does with his girlfriend, K Kalila, right? Kalila. And, all right. Yeah, it's, it's been there's all this drama surrounding the show because it's been revealed that Kalila is just, uh, I guess you could say she's a terrible human being. And she's, yeah. she's kind of like a self admitted gold digger. And she said that she jerked jerked off her dog, wow. and yeah, and that she uh, had sex with her brother. That's pretty crazy. And a lot of her are a lot of people are kind of like because this show has a lot of is a this on TV or it, it's on YouTube? Like there, like YouTube. like the show, there's a video version of it, and there's a lot of big comedians that go on there, like Brendan Schwab. 
that MMA fighter that's uh, you know like friends with Joe Rogan, all those people. He goes on there, you know, or Margaret Chow. Remember that before AVC. this shit is over, you've asked me a question though for a reason. Why are you asking me this question? Because we, we, we are in the podcasting world, and we should cover big news. Yeah, we should. We should. I have world. not seen that. Pardon. I have not seen that. Please send me a link to this disgusting, gross stuff so I can give you a view on it later on. It sounds well, pretty sick. Okay, here's the thing, Todd. <laughs> Could I be mistaken? Here's here's the thing. This girl, she didn't have any career in comedy. She did not have anything like that going on. But she, oh. because she's Bobby's girlfriend, <laughs> she got to be on a podcast with Bobby Lee as like, <laughs> Is Bobby Lee funny? Yeah, he's hilarious. Oh, see, that's the part I'm missing. Yeah, he's been that's in a lot of my... Is he the Asian guy that's... Yeah, he's funny? kind of a small Asian guy. And he, he was part of that thing, the, the Kims of comedy. And that guy Kim Jong from Hangover was part of it too. Oh, yeah, that guy. Yeah, he's I mean, funny. I guess... Not like into this sort of stuff, you probably wouldn't give a no, shit. No, it isn't that. Gary Wayne was talking about how Lee is one of the thirteen family bloodlines. The Lee so family. The, the Lee family. So you don't you don't want to talk on your to show podcasting drama? You want to go right back to Illuminati stuff? I kind of lean towards that. Sorry. All right. Fair enough. No, I, I can come back to the. I can come back to um, what's or not. Uh, What's your next? Uh... Todd Al, aka Martian Medicine Man, he knows who Bobby Lee is. He's pointing out that he was on Mad TV. Well, I wish he would send a picture or something so we could all, you know, see who he is. But is there some reason we're talking about this? Well, this woman is sucking the marrow out of his bones. She's par- parasitizing him. She's I don't, I don't him. get. I don't get what. That's my problem, I guess, is I don't get what the okay, significance is. Off. Is there some sports teams we could talk about? <laughs> Let's is there move some on. game that happened? Mark From Mark Reyna in the chat, new alien movie, Jules, near end of trailer, they show the name Jules with light behind what me. About, across. What about Indiana Jones, the fucking Stone of Time or whatever, the latest show? Uh Harrison. Weren't we going to talk about the freedom, sound of freedom? I heard you say you were going to talk about the sound of freedom, but okay, Indiana okay. Jones is going to be something entirely different. Let's move on from this. So, come on so, now, Doctor Robert Todd, have you guys seen the preview for the movie Napoleon? No, I didn't know there was a movie Napoleon. Now I want to see it. No, it's Ridley Scott. I haven't heard nothing about it. And it's got Joaquin Phoenix, the guy that played the Joker. He's going to play Napoleon. Sounds pretty good. Sounds pretty good. He's like, he'll make a good Napoleon. I think so. Yeah, his look. Sounds fantastic. Have yeah. you heard anything about it? By that? I saw the trailer. It looks, it's probably the only movie that I've actually wanted to see in a long time. Yeah, I like those type about of movies. Napoleon? Like Bret Hart, any type of like war movie. I'm down. Well, let me tell you, I've studied war history. Napoleonic Wars, Europe, the way they were all forced to fight. By Rothschild. Napoleon, Rothschilds funding all the armies, leading us into World War I, leading us into World War II. I brought the book, I brought the book out. I'm not even going to do it. Yep, no, I brought the book out. Remember how I just keep talking about the, the book, The War Against the Wheat? That talked yeah. about the eugenicist. Out of the blue, the spirit opened this fucking page and it went right to that paragraph. One paragraph. This is before World War I. This is just the history of the eugenicist movement. Quickly, Davenport, he's one of the most, uh, my wife says, shut the hell up. But <laughs> my She's wife like, says, oh, you please there. stop yelling. Davenport and the Carnegie Institution became the center of the 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 center center of the eugenics world for German researchers. Um, 
American America was enacting a growing body of eugenics laws and governmental practices and the movement enjoyed wealthy backers. Do you mean, are you you mean like segregation? Yeah, no listen. Quickly after before World War 1 Davenport and the Carnegie Institution. Do you know who the Carnegies are, Daniel? Yeah, they're another American one of those families. Super rich families. families. Super rich Rockefellers. Well, 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 um, one more thing. I want to answer somebody's question. Yes, I did hear that Beatles song. If you keep yelling, I'm going to shut the internet off here. (laughs) I'm going to finish. Let me just read this paragraph. So he has heard the song. Quickly, Davenport and the Carnegie Institution became the center of the eugenic world for German researchers. America, Americans, America was enacting a growing in body of eugenic laws and governmental practices, and the movement was taking action at the same time by virtue of their I, the fucking Nazis. Okay. <laughs> the Nazis were praising us before World War One. We yeah. were the big brother to oh, their no, little yeah, brother, definitely. Yeah, they, they were telling the those motherfuckers what to do. Minutes. You know, because like uh, the, U, the U.S. My wife's like, I'm shutting U, it off. It was just always this tension between like the Christian religion and like the way like white America. And I'm talking about white supremacist America, not white people, have treated black people to where they need to create these justifications to somehow sort of um, sort of reconcile their Christian beliefs, basically. So if they could, don't have to view us as full human beings and we don't really have like full souls and those type of things, then they're not Call required, the other. they're not required morally to treat us the way you would expect them to treat other human beings. So that's why they created all, you know, they're not really human beings. They're like some type of missing leak species between us and a real human. All or they have the mark to, of Cain. All, yeah, all, yep. All that's done to assay, assuage their guilt. You know, I before, give you World War One, before World War I, they were hunting down not just people of dark skin, anybody that they could deem mentally retarded. Yeah, everything. Yeah, old people too. Yeah, old people mentally retarded. Yep. If you oh, had dwarfism, sick motherfuckers. Uh, all right, That's guys. Um, uh, unfortunately, we are starting to run out of time, so I do want to mm. um, give give both of you guys the podium for a second. Um, let's do Dr. Robert first. Dr. Robert, thank you for joining us. We are running out of time, but go ahead and hop up on that soapbox or step behind the podium and say whatever you would like to say to the audience out there and please follow that up with anything you'd like to plug. Uh, you know, I want you guys to keep watching the show. Me and Daniel working on something, a new way of learning where I actually will begin by relaxing your mind and taking you through like kind of like a hypnotic journey where it's kind of like an experience, but inside this hypnotic journey, I'm going to help your mind on a subconscious level sort of retain and taking very complex um, information and data. So be on the lookout for that. It's gonna be something that's gonna really like um, help you guys become better critical thinkers and the information that we share with you guys is gonna be factual, you know, factual and very, um, very useful. I mean, that's the best way I can say it. I'm kind of getting tired now, but be on the lookout for that. There's gonna be a few episodes. We're gonna get into some deep stuff. Stay tuned, guys. Anything I, else? Yeah, yeah. You know, and uh, give AOC a chance. I work with her, and she's cool. But that's it. <laughs> <laughs> she's she's sexy. Yeah, she's cool though. I want to get it out definitely, but I definitely want to. She, she's. Cool, Do you know who man. she kind of reminds me of a little bit? Who? Lucille Ball. Kinda. I see that. I see that. Yeah. Her prisms. Yep, I see that. She's yeah. kind of got that quirkiness. 
Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. But she's sincere, man. And she's for all people. Check out her website. We got to get her on the show. Yeah, maybe we can. Maybe we can. Heck yeah. That's if there's a will, it. there's a way. That's about it. All right, my friend. Like magic and like, you know, like this stuff. I share it with her all the time, like magic. I've been talking with her, you know, about um, about like NASA and the occult. What you talk? You're talking to AOC about that stuff? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm saying you're like she's into me. that stuff, dude. Like, like I mean, like I mean, like I mean, like she's. I'm telling you, man, it's not what you guys think, man. Like, you know. So she's got this other side to her. Yeah, g- give it a chance. Hmm. I'm intrigued. <laughs> give her a chance, man. All righty. All right, Doctor Robert. Mind, man. She, 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 she's a nerd like we are. I like you know, that. Like, had like I had like I think like a meteor named after. Her. You know, like a science fair and all that stuff. Comic book nerd, and she's just like us, dude. I love that. Yeah. All right, Doctor Robert, I appreciate you coming on. We will, Always. we will get, we will talk offline. Hey, Todd, pleasure, man. You make my pleasure. day, Todd. Can you you too, me? buddy. Oh yeah, I can hear you. Oh man, I love you, man. You, you, you make. I love feel, you, man. You're very uplifting. I want to sit. Least. And, I, I want to sit and talk to you, Dr. Robert. I want to have a show where it's just me and you. You know what, man? Uh, you, I give Daniel permission issues. to give you my phone number. Daniel has my number. So All if right. you have my like, Daniel email, he can give it to you. Okay, we'll yeah. do it. Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Thanks, buddy. We will talk to you again. All righty. And Todd, um, go ahead. And, would you like to get on the soapbox and say whatever you'd like to say to the fans to get out on there? The soapbox. And My follow- wife has asked me to please not yell <laughs> or she's going to shut off the internet. How does that sound? Can we do that, Daniel? Well, uh, you might have to go on internet restriction. I'll talk to your wife about that. We'll decide your punishment. Daniel says he'll ask you, can you come on or not? <laughs> she's not the point. I don't, I don't like the yelling. She doesn't like the yelling. I'm sorry. I get excited I about certain... And we're in an apartment. That's a fucking... That's the part. We don't want people getting freaked out around us. I just don't need to be yelling. There's no fucking reason. For and it. Jesse says, there's no reason to yell. If you have an argument, why should you yell? She didn't say that, but that's what she meant. You argue with people on the internet. You can argue with smart. people on the internet all day. Real smart. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for all getting right, me on Let's the wrap show, it up buddy. because I got to get back in the there bathroom. Is. Nature is calling. got to go to the bathroom. Big topics today. Dr. Robert, right on. Come back again. Wow, you got Gary Wayne. Oh, Dr. Robert and Gary Wayne, that's kind of like Frankenstein and the Mummy meeting. Big time sci-fi show. I love it. I love those guys. Both of them. Incredible. Um, Dan, you got the best show going. All right. And and uh Todd, I, I apologize, but man, I don't know if it's this energy drink or what, but I gotta use the bathroom again and I'm not done with the show. So I gotta like either just not get to sports or take another little break and then come back. And I better do that. But right now, man, number two is calling. I know I shouldn't talk about that on the show. It is just killing me. So I'll be back in a second. Thank you.
And I am back. Thank you, everybody, for joining. Okay. I'm trying not to wreck this show with my sudden and arduous case of the diarrhea brought to me by the wonderful folks at Monster Energy. I've heard that actually, these symbols on the Monster Energy drink actually mean 666 in Hebrew. And no surprise that they have unleashed hell within my bowels and are, are trying to ruin this amazing show with Gary Wayne, right? Everything's going great. And then suddenly, oh no. Yeah. Okay. I got to wrap this show up because I am not done. I am like chained to the toilet now. So uh, sports. Do, 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 do. Take me out to the ball game. Let's get into it. I don't know how many of you guys watched the All-Star game, but it was a lot of fun. It was right here in Seattle. The, the <laughs> I almost said the Northern League. What is this? The Civil War? The National League won. I guess they haven't won since like 2011 or 2012. So I'm happy for them. The whole thing was a lot of fun. It was just nonstop smiles and joy. Julio hit a record amount of home runs during the home run derby the day before so we are very proud of him in seattle and one when shohei otani was batting the seattle fans actually broke out into a chant of come to seattle come to seattle absolutely love that i hope we managed to snag otani if if uh baseball is good now if we had him on the team holy crap he's like the best player in baseball they're saying he's the best japanese player of all time i would absolutely love to see that uh, in other local sports news, there's more clues that the Seattle Supersonics will be coming back. The NBA commission has said that they are currently doing the groundwork for figuring out which teams to add expansions for. So we will, should be seeing something coming down the pipeline soon. Hopping over to the NFL and the role of football, Jalen Carter is being sued for a car accident in college. So... I'm sure there's drinking involved. I don't know, but that's bad. That's really bad. It's coming back to bite them. A lot of irresponsible drinking and GHB passing around and stuff like that happening in college. I'm glad I never went because I, I avoided any of that frat bullshit, any of that homoerotic fixated crap that those boys get involved in very immature if you ask me and very tuned into uh secret societies and skull and bones and all that all those ivy league schools managed to avoid that i went to clown college instead <laughs> mark zuckerberg is jumping over the world of mma or billionaire douchebags uh, mark zuckerberg is training for his big fight with elon musk with Israel Adesanya, Adesanya. Boy, I probably botched that. I'm sorry. I haven't watched that much MMA in recent years. I used to be obsessed with it. In Israel Adesanya. He's, he's training with them. He's taking pictures. He's in shape. He's got a six pack. Uh, probably released that to counter the pictures of Elon Musk that he released when he's in a gi and he's doing some training on the mat. These guys are taking this seriously. 
Um, how would you feel if these guys are out training and these guys that already have all this money, how does it feel knowing that they could probably kick your ass too? Right. Cause they're actually training in MMA, which is very effective. It like, it doesn't hurt enough that they have so much control over the world in our daily lives. But now we got to know deep down that they could probably beat us up for shame, for shame. Everybody needs to go out there and train some MMA. So you can one up these billionaire guys. Um, Jumping over to the world of wrestling, I like to do like one MMA story, one wrestling story, and then like jump around the MLB and NFL and stuff like that. That way we're covering a, a wide swath. Uh, if we just focus on one sport, maybe you don't like that sport and you get bored. So we're going to focus on all, like all of them and we're going to include some MMA and wrestling too. So I guess Liv Morgan and Margot Robbie, Margot Robbie from the Barbie movie actually met and people are saying they look like twins. Big news, right? Because they both look like blonde Barbies. Why did you pick that story? Why? Of all the things you could talk about, two bimbos that look alike, so what? I think they're great. They're very pretty. I enjoy their work. And that's it. That's sports. Um, Todd is just, he's talking and he's not done yet. He's, what, Todd? You want, what? What? You're going on about MMA. Do we have a bunch of wrestling fans on here tonight? We got some. We got some. Is Joe Rogan listening? Uh, possibly. Who knows? Possibly. If I get too loud, my wife's going to just end the show. She's going to shut the internet off. We're going to see a frying pan just fly across the screen. We're going to see a frying pan fly smash my we'll face. Do. Who's that so, up in the corner? Is that Julius Caesar? No, that is... Uh, <clears throat> that is uh, Aurelius. Marcus Aure Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius. Okay. Uh -huh. from Good Greece. choice. Right. He, um, he's from one of my favorite movies of all time, Gladiator. Yeah, that's that guy. Ridley Scott. Who's yeah, also doing the Napoleon him. movie. I couldn't find a statue of somebody I loved. I had to settle on that guy. I like but it that. Was. He's beautiful. He's beautiful. He has a beautiful mind. He, in California, courts ruled that schools must provide a sandbox for some teenagers that think they are an animal, a furry animal. We're going to get into social wars. That is so wars. weird. Like, wow. What? The school has to put a sandbox in the restroom for the kid who thinks he's a furry animal. Is now, he gonna I'm poop, gonna poop in the sandbox? I'm not gonna discuss what he's gonna do. I'm just gonna move past that that has occurred. If you want to register that you on know, your daily when end of days. When I was a teenager, doing stuff like that would almost certainly get you beat. Do up. you think that when you were a teenager they would let you go shit in the sandbox in the restroom at your high school, Daniel? No, no you they would brutally ragged on until you would you get beaten. <laughs> You would get beaten to a bloody pulp, probably. Wow, how the world has changed. You would get assaulted, certainly. <laughs> when you were a teenager, you would get beaten to a bloody pulp if you tried to pull that shit off. Now, now, now you get beat up if you're just like a straight, normal type of person. Now you get beat up if you're a straight, normal person. Yeah, all the trends <laughs> and like pansexual and animal kids, they come up and they start beating on you. You freak, <laughs> we hate you. Today... Today you get beat up if you're normal. What you want to date you girls? Yeah. You like girls? Oh, you God, sick I like girls, and girls with That's so kids. ungodly. Wow, it's getting twisted. If I get too loud, my wife's gonna shut All right, uh, it's it's almost four hours and twenty minutes. That's a good number to stop the show. So, Why don't you? No, I got No, but you, I gotta go you, through all the the last of these headlines. No, no, no. We, we want up. you to sing. We want you to sing. Oh, and you want me to sing? Yeah, let's 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 finish this off with a little bit of a little rendition. Go ahead. A rendition of, of of what? Is the end of days. Well, hold on, hold on. Before we get to that, oh the no, hypocrisy, the hypocrisy. Cocaine is found in the White House, Daniel. Oh, you know, cocaine oh, in the White story. House. A news yeah, we, story. We, we got to like keep going on the news stories. 
We got to bring back the news stories because people want to know the news stories. When they find cocaine in the White House, Daniel, our minds are all supposed to think sympathetic about Hunter Biden. Oh, the president's son has a drug problem. Oh, how <laughs> sad is that? Oh, I thought it was Biden's cocaine. You know, people that are hooked on my wife's like, would you shut the fuck up? People are like, when you have a drug problem, you shouldn't you? When your neighbors yell, can you can you hear them? Can you hear them? Doing I can stuff? almost hear them. I can almost they hear, can hear you. That's how that works. <laughs> they can hear me. If you can I, hear them, they can hear you. And my wife can hear me from the bedroom. Yeah. So, no matter how excited I get about this, so you're educating them. When I get when 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 Hunter Biden smokes cocaine, oh, we're all supposed to feel sorry for him. He has a drug problem. But when you smoke cocaine, you're going to go to fucking prison. And we're going to put you away for a long time. But when Hunter Biden smokes it in the White House, oh, we should feel sorry because someone has a drug problem. But when you smoke it, you're going to fucking prison for a long time. No wonder my wife wants me to shut the fuck up because we're going to shut the, get the show shut down. Hunter Biden is going to send his agents to shut us down. How dare you talk about my coke problem? Scumbag sniffing hair. Have you, you seen, a, a, have you seen Goodfellas? Terry. Have you seen Goodfellas? Yeah, of course. Do you remember the end of the movie where the main character, um, I can't think of his name at the moment, Henry Hill, he's like getting... He's on coke and he's getting paranoid and there's a helicopter going above. He's going like this, and then there's like an airplane. And he's just like getting paranoid and he 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 knows the rest of the mafia is going to kill him, and, but he doesn't right. know when. And uh, like oh. Mickey, Mickey's telling his wife to come or not Mickey, but the guy that's played by um. Almost remember Robert that Nero. part. What's and the point? Come over here. What's the well, point? That's what cocaine does to you. It makes you paranoid. That's the point. That's a perfect. Does it make the Secret Service paranoid to know there's cocaine that's been discovered? No. Well, Goodfellas Some is probably one of the best cocaine in the White time. House, and it was probably one of the fucking presidential. I've never done cocaine. Am I a loser? Because you've never, I've never done, done cocaine? cocaine. No. Well, Daniel, you need to go get some you some fucking cocaine and go do it. I, so you I don't hang out with rich. Figure out what the fuck you're talking about here. That's like um, rich kids. Just go do it so you can figure out what these assholes are doing. The, the poor kids would do pot and mushrooms and beer, and the rich kids do cocaine. What about the sound of freedom before the show's over? Let's talk about that. It's a psyop. It's a trap. You go to see it. They track you. They take the your movie picture. Is a psyop. I heard. I heard Carlos Slim put a lot of money. He's the richest man in Mexico. Why would the richest man in Mexico put some money behind a movie that? influences you emotionally and they push it through in the United States after they because they're, they're satiating that crowd they're satiating the, the patriot crowd that's into this stuff that have been Why reading don't... these stories for years and years because they want to keep that going because they manipulate people by by pitting the right wing against the left wing why don't they do a movie about Jeffrey Epstein where it shows all your people that are in, right in there Kisley that everyone Maxwell. you know love is involved Kisley in Maxwell. this all. Played by yeah, Demi Moore. Moore. Demi Moore, there you is go. Jimmy, uh, there you go. Who plays Who's Jeffrey Epstein? Epstein? Who, would you, who would you pick? Who would you pick? Daniel? Jim Carrey? Because he's been Jim to Epstein Carrey. Island anyway. He's got to be fat. Uh, or not fat, but kind of. Jim, Jim Carrey's fat. Skinny. He's, yeah, Jim Epstein. Jeff Ski or how Epstein. about uh, Ben Stiller? He kind of looks like Epstein. Uh, they're both Jewish, but uh, you, you bringing that well, anti-Semitism on the show again? I ain't anti-Semitic, <laughs> and you know what? I ain't anti-Jewish. I, I love Jewish people. I'm just kidding. But, uh, if you're involved in the, in what's taking the world down, and don't matter what your religion is. Mormon, Jewish, Christian. If you're part of them taking the world down, get the fuck out of here. That's what I'd say. Um, I love that last show, Daniel, with the Mason. 
that was yeah, kind of coming on, he telling us, He's hey, I'm, I'm Masons. I'm Mason, and they're, they're not involved in none of this. Hey, you know, wow. Todd, I went to a Masonic temple in my town, right? I went to just like, I went driving around and I punched it into the GPS. And I just want to see if I could like see any of the hidden symbology in the building. You drove there. And I, I found some, like the windows, right? The yeah, windows, are shaped like, yeah, they're shaped like eyeballs, right? And then the lines and the bricks, you know, the lines going in between the bricks, they're, they're made to look like eyelashes. No way. Yeah, and this type the of stuff is on a lot of between the bricks. Yeah, I mean like the bricks get pushed together and the way that it looks is like the windows and eyeball and the bricks are like the eyelashes, the you know the lines between the bricks. What do you make of it? Eyeball all seeing eye. All seeing eye. Yeah, the eye of Horus or Shem Yaz's eye or Odin's eye or um there's so many different ones. There's so many. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's the one thing. People don't understand about the um, Jerry Wayne. You know, he's Christian. The first thing when I hear a Christ all Christians coming on, I'm, in, I'm like, wow, I'm going to counter him. Jerry Wayne is so deeply researched that you're not countering it. You're just listening. Your mind's being blown. Just listen to the research. What you think's going on, you might not realize. You might not have researched that deep. I like to think I look deep, but man, there's people, Daniel, that have way more time than we do to look into this shit before the show's over. Please, if you like this show, if you laughed at this show, if you found anything interesting in this show, would you donate to this fucking show? Daniel ain't going to sit here and do this forever. Everybody else charges money. Everybody else has paywalls. You got five hours of killer shit going down with Daniel. Can you give him five bucks a month or six months? See what he can do with it? We're getting ready to do a big fundraiser, Daniel. I love the show so much. I've got all kinds of ideas. I'm going to sit and spin through them. When we're not on the show, I'm going to figure out how to get your show making more money. If you All love right. this show, I appreciate that. This show. Thanks, Daniel, for a killer show. Keep rocking this motherfucker. Thank you, Todd. Okay, we are about to hit the four and a half hour mark. And I don't want to go too long because if people see the show's five hours, they'll think, wow, that's a big chunk of my life. I'm not sure if I want to invest that. So I think four and a half hours is a good mark. I am getting tired. My back is starting to ache. My bowels are rumbling. Um, I'm getting hungry, which is usually a good sign because that hunger is going to like counteract that diarrhea. It's going to absorb that diarrhea like an abyss, and then I'll be fine again, and I'll be able to eat and feel good. So that's how you have to handle that. you got to wait it out. But anyways, enough of my disgusting bathroom life. Let's talk about next week. Next week, we will be bringing on our friends, our friends, Lee, generally from Subconscious Realms, and Lux from Occult Rejects and their new show, Subconscious Rising, because these two know each other. I bet you didn't know that, did you? You didn't. It's a small world, isn't it? These two guys actually know each other, which makes sense because I actually met the Occult Rejects guys through Lee. So it's not that shocking, but they are going to be coming on and discussing this new project of theirs, which I am very interested in. And I know you are as well. So we will be touching bases with those guys. Hopefully lots of hijinks ensue as usual. And then the following week, we will be talking to my buddy verb who I've known for quite a long time. We've had some very deep philosophical discussions and what the spirits tell me is this man was brought into my life path for a very specific purpose. He's basically the modern day Leonardo da Vinci. And he knows it too. He's, he's told me that. He said, you don't know who I am. And then he told me who he is. And I said, you're full of shit. And then he said, no, it's true. And I thought, maybe this guy's telling the truth. Maybe he is. But we will be talking to him about everything. Heaven, 
hell, Eden, the gods, and everything in between. We will be talking to him about the devil and God as well. And then the following week, we're going to be talking to somebody very interesting who just came out of nowhere, who came out of the woodwork, somebody I've never heard before, somebody I've never heard of before. This man, this man contacted me, and he said, Daniel, I need to talk to you, because you are the only person, and your show is the only platform that's going to understand what I have to say. We're going to go deep with him. He's a PhD, he's a researcher, and he's going to take us deep into the realms. So look forward to that. That's August 4th. That's how far we're booked out. I can't seem to get very far without another show being booked. So I've, I've, it's been effortless because this show is blowing up. It's exploding. It's getting huge. And people are emailing me at danielendofdaysradio at gmail.com. That's Daniel End of Days Radio at gmail Dan, Daniel End of Days Radio at gmail .com. If you'd like to be a guest on the show, if you'd like to comment, if you'd like to criticize, contact me at Daniel End of Days Radio at gmail .com. We do have a letter from a listener. This is from Chantel Griffin, and she says, "Hi Daniel, I love the new show format, but could you please fart into the mic?" What? Isn't it coincidental that she would that I would read that email now on this episode where I'm actually having those issues? Um, I would like to do that, but I'm not sure if it would be going a little too far, if that would turn off a lot of my audience, if that would drive folk away, or if they'd love it. I don't know. If you have anything to say about that, write me at danielendofdaysradio at gmail.com. Tell me if I should or should not fluctuate into this mic. And then I'm going to put my face up to it. That's pretty gross. But hey, we got to end this show sometime. I appreciate you guys. You are truly the wind beneath my wings. You keep this show going. You keep me motivated. You keep me happy and positive about things. You, you are everything. How else can I put it? You're everything. The fans of this show are everything to me. I listen to you. You're my boss. Tell me what to do. Show me the way. I'll see you guys ne next week. Until then, until then, goodbye, good night, and stay awake. What more is there to say? <laughs>